Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the board will participate in our regular board meeting. It will be conducted using Google Meet technology for board members and staff who are participating live. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channel 235 or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. We also offer a listening only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1-561-880-1124 with a pound sign. I know that's a lot of numbers to remember and I've asked the uh, education network to put that on the screen for those of you at home, you'll see that on your screen at this time. I now call the regular meeting of the school board of Palm Beach County to order at 5 p.m. on July 22nd, 2020. Mrs. Bass, will you please call the roll? Dr. District one, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District two, Chuck Shaw. Uh, Mr. Shaw is having some technical difficulties. He's going to call in uh, through his phone in just a few moments. District three, Karen Brill. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marcia Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. All right, also joining us on the virtual dais today is Superintendent Dr. Donald Fenoy, General Counsel Julianne Rico, Inspector General Teresa Michael, and Board Clerk Carol Bass. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the superintendent. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so remember to speak at a reasonable pace. Now please direct your attention to the flag on the screen. Dr. Fenoy, as soon as that flag appears, will you please lead us in the pledge? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. A quick review of our meeting protocol. Remember, if you're not speaking, your microphone should be, be on mute. Um, I've asked Mrs. Bass to kind of kind of monitor this for all of us. So if you forget to turn your microphone off and all of a sudden you see it's off, it's probably because Mrs. Bass has turned it off. Uh, we get feedback when, and some it's, I know it's easy to forget because I do the same thing. I leave my microphone on sometimes when it should be on mute. If you need to step away from the meeting for a moment, please turn off your camera. For the public's information, when a board member's camera is off, the board member is still present at the meeting and can still see and hear what's happening. I'd like to welcome the public speakers who are joining us in person today. While your attendance here at the board office is appreciated, please be mindful of important safety protocols that the district now has in place to conform with COVID-19 safety guidelines. Please respect this cautionary warning that in the event of interference with the orderly processes of the meeting, failure to follow the safety protocols and procedures or otherwise disruptive conduct. This conduct will result in removal of the person from the meeting. Please abide by these protocols so Palm Beach County School Police officers do not have to take action. First item on the agenda is the uh, items added for good cause. Um, we have one item that's been added for good cause. It's ELR1. Good cause exists at the Wednesday, July 15 virtual special meeting. The board voted to approve the school reopening plan without an approved start date of the school year. As discussed at that meeting, the recommended start date and school year calendar will be brought back to the board for a vote at the July 22nd virtual board meeting. Good cause exists to add this item so the board can vote for the benefit of the public, including students, parents, and employees. Further, the templates of the plan need to be submitted to the Florida Department of Education by July 31st, 2020. Mr. Superintendent, do you have any items to withdraw? Mr. Chairman, I have nothing to withdraw at this time. Board members, do you have any items you wish to pull from consent? We need a motion to approve the agenda as modified by the addition of the LR1. Motion by Mrs. McQuinn, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 unless Mr. Shaw is here. Ms. Mrs. Bass, has Mr. Shaw joined the meeting? He is on his phone and will let me know. He can hear you all. He is attached, yes. Okay, so since I didn't hear any objection from him, the motion carries 7-0. 
Board members, do you have any uh, disclosures or abstentions? Seeing none. Mr. Superintendent, your comments, please. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by congratulating the nearly 200 members of the class of 2020 who will be, who will be taking part in their summer virtual graduation ceremony tomorrow evening. We invite you to watch the commencement ceremony, which begins at 6 p.m. on Comcast channel 234 and ATT UVerse channels 99. On behalf of the school board and the entire district, we wish our graduates the best of luck as they head into their careers or college. We look forward to seeing all that they accomplish and may they always be lifelong learners. Summer has also continued to be a time of learning for more than 6,000 students who participated in extended school year. Students with individual education plans received instruction in critical therapies virtually. The 400 teachers leading ESY this summer also created their own Google Classrooms to interact, ask questions, and share resources with each other. ESC department leaders formed new connections with teachers from different schools. They hope to maintain this new level of virtual collaboration into the upcoming school year. The multicultural department also brought summer learning to life for, for about 300 students in the migrant education program by sending backpacks filled with supplies to their homes for hands-on projects, such as building miniature sports stadiums out of paper. We had 1,500 students in the English for Speakers of Other Languages, or ESOL virtual summary program, all received a graphic novel to read and discuss during online literature circles with teachers and classmates. The School District of Palm Beach County is a leader <clears throat> in educational technology, and for that reason, we are proud to, know, to now be a part of the Google Reference Program. This is a huge recognition for the district. Google for Education reference districts demonstrates excellence and thought leadership through the innovative use of technology, including G Suite, which is the Google Suite for education, and Chromebooks to drive impact and positive learning outcomes. We all learned firsthand when the district shifted to distance learning last March that technology is and will be a fundamental tool for achieving our pillars of effective instruction and providing digital and blended learning opportunities. And finally, Promises made, promises kept. Your penny has been hard at work this summer, updating more than a dozen campuses throughout the district. The penny sales tax, which was approved by the voters in 2016, has helped upgrade schools dramatically. From Pioneer Park in the Glades to Palm Beach Lakes High School in, in West Palm Beach to Woodlands Middle School in suburban Lake Worth, the work is remarkable. Visit the district's website, palmbeachschools.org, to see the many ways that the penny sales tax is making a tremendous difference in our district. Although we will be starting the year in a distance learning mode of instruction, this district -wide, these district-wide improvements will make the return to our campuses that much more special when it is safe to resume in-person instruction. These improvements will be enjoyed by students and staff for years to come. To the members of this particular community, we thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Those are my comments for today. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Board member comments, uh, Mrs. McQuinn? None at this time. Vice Chairman Shaw, are you here? Mrs. Brill. Thank you. The only thing I would like to say is just a thank you to everyone that has reached out to us by phone, by email. I know all of us are probably in the same position I am. I try to get back to as many people as I can. I can assure you, I do read all of your email messages and it just shows you how important education is to our community. So I just wanna say thank you and let you know that we are all doing the absolute best that we can. We know that everyone is not going to be happy, but what we are doing is coming from our heart. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Microphone problem there for a minute. Uh, Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, I did actually want to make some comments tonight. Um, I wanted to, to start this board meeting by saying to everyone um, how grateful I am for our administrative staff. They have put in tireless hours, skipping vacation and putting their own family's needs aside to help us in this process. I'm also really grateful to the residents who firm, fervently care about all our children and they write to support us or to rightfully question our decisions and put so much time and effort into those emails that Ms. Brill mentioned. Um, I really do try to read them all as well and um, respond to as many as possible. Um, it is a challenge because there's thousands, but um, I really do appreciate it. I'm also super grateful to our teachers who stepped up to the plate um, in the spring when we had the most uncertain of times and had to 
and had to continue to offer their unwavering commitment and dedication to their profession and to our children to make school wonderful in the fall. I wanna thank our custodians and tell them how grateful I am to them. Um, they've made the cleaning of our schools a life and death priority and leaving their families and making sure that they came to take care of our schools. And the food service workers who you know I have a very soft spot in my heart for, um, they came in and served our children when many of us stayed at home just so that no one would go hungry. And finally, I'm very grateful to my fellow board members um, because many of you, I feel, feel like I do, which is that public service is more of a calling than a job. And, and I appreciate your time and effort. I know how seriously we've all taken this time. So for everyone out there, however you feel about our work going forward, I want you to know that I'm grateful for our community and all of you as we go through this together. Thank you sincerely. Thank you, Mrs. Whitfield. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone, especially the parents, the teachers, the whole staff of the school district of Palm Beach County and our beloved community. I'm worried about our children. I know they need to be back into their school, the building itself as soon as possible. We are still sitting here in phase one of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Every parent should have a choice for their children. Teachers and staff should have a choice based on their health conditions during this pandemic. Distance learning is not a substitute for in-class learning with the teacher to help to guide the children each and every day. It is our only choice right now because we're still sitting here in phase one and we're getting more infections day by day. But we are all in this together. But the parents, I want you to know, you have a very powerful voice as it relates to your child. Over the past several weeks, I've spoken to many of you. Many of you are doctors who have children in the Palm Beach County School District. And many times you shared opinions that differ from what I see on the news and on the television. But we have to work together because truly, all about the children. We must continue to listen to all sides as we move forward for the success of the children. I want to especially thank the Boys and Girls Clubs and the agencies that have been working with our children throughout this summer. Ms. Andrews, Ms. Andrews, yeah. I'm sorry, YouTube went down. I don't want your comments to be lost. Oh, okay. Okay, we're going to obviously suspend the meeting temporarily until we get assurances that we're back up with you. Okay, Am I allowed to call attention to someone's birthday while we're offline? This is Mrs. Rico's not shaking her head, no or yes, so go ahead. <laughs> so we didn't get to give Mrs. Rico her cupcake. Her birthday was Sunday. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. It was my first virtual birthday, 100% virtual. And so you look fantastic, Julianne. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, let me take a moment while we're down. I just want to thank you all for uh, your 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 condolences and gifts to to my father in law's funeral. It was a uh, a huge surprise to the family to see flowers come from the district and some of you as individuals. So my wife is uh, she's just she's over overjoyed with your support and uh, just thank you guys so much for it. <clears throat>
I've been advised by Mr. Ruiz that we're back online, so we'll con continue. Mrs. Andrews, would you go ahead and continue, please? Mr. Barbieri, I'd like to start back over since I don't know who's when we were off or when we were on. So is it first Sir, first yes. that I may start back over? First of all, I'd like to say good afternoon to the parents, teachers, staff, and especially the community. I'm so worried about our children. I know they need to be back into their school building as soon as possible. We are still sitting here in phase one of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Every parent should have a choice for their children. Teachers and staff should have a choice based on their health conditions during this pandemic. Distance learning is not a substitute for in-class learning with a teacher. It is our hope that we can get out of phase one as soon as possible. But this is where we sit right now. And we're getting to do the best we can each and every day. But we're getting more infections each and every day. We are all in this together. But parents, your voice is very powerful as it relates to your child. Over the past several weeks, I've spoken to doctors who have children within the Palm Beach County School District. They have shared their opinions, and many times they differ from the opinions I read in the paper each day or see on the news. But we must continue to listen to all sides as we move forward for the success of our children. I want to personally thank the Boys and Girls Club and other agencies for working all summer tirelessly to help our children in summer camps. They helped our children academically, socially, and emotionally. The school board must continue to make sure that these agencies continue to help our neediest children each and every single day. And finally, I want to congratulate all the graduates on, um, on tomorrow who will actually get their diploma and get a handshake virtually. You did it. You did it. You graduated. Congratulations to all of the graduates for summer. And thank you all for all you do as we work together for the betterment of our children. We're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Andrews. Dr. Roberts, before we come to you, I see Vice Chairman Shaw back. So Mr. Shaw, do you have any comments you'd like to make? Yes, thank you. Um, I know that we've been going through some very interesting times to say the least. And the challenges that we face are things that none of us have, would have ever even begun to believe could happen. And I think that one of the one of the things that the public doesn't see and is the work that's being done by the superintendent and the executive staff and the work that's been done for several weeks. And I really think it's important for us to know that when they spend the entire weekend for several weeks in a row working on trying to solve our problems and come up with recommendations that work for us, I think it's something that the public doesn't always, in fact, probably never realizes the effort that's being put forth. And I really think that um, that it's important for us to thank the superintendent and staff for doing this. And I ask that everybody in the community realize that we are in this together, that in order for us to have anything um, ready to do in the future, we have to do it together. We can't do it alone and we've got to work together. I want to also thank two of the cities in, um, that are working right now, the city of Green Acres and the village of Palm Springs, who both have made an offer to step forward and work with providing um, in-house opportunities um, within their cities to work with students of the employees of both those cities uh, so that those employees will be able to continue to come to work every day and still have um, the availability of, of working with their children online. And I think it's that partnership that we can see from other cities that I would hope that every city in this entire county and every business in this county would come forward and work with us to try to help solve this problem. I know none of us want to see um, us continue with this kind of a, a pro. A, opportunities for our children be provided in this way with these kinds of programs that we need our children back in school, but we need to do it in a way that's responsible. So I want to again, thank the superintendent 
and everybody in his staff for doing an amazing job and working so hard to make us uh, successful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I got, I just got a text that we're offline again. So are we, or are we not? Um, IT people are standing here next to me. Tell me we're online. So hopefully that's we're online. Okay. All right. That's fine. So thank you very much. Um, so I just want to say um, we're in a crisis in case you didn't know, right? We're in a pandemic unlike anything that has been experienced in more than a century. And so there's a lot of things that um, are new to us and that as has been said, we have to handle them together. There's so very many things that have to be considered in our decision-making. I want to thank you, my colleagues for district administration for finally hearing me uh, regarding my concerns um, about of this virus and the dangers it poses. Now, I too listen to all sides, but I have to do everything that I can to make sure that we do everything that we can do to keep our students and employees safe. So I also want to thank the Health Advisory Committee for bringing their expertise to the table to help guide the school district. Um, and sometimes it's very um, affirming for me to hear my professional colleagues uh, say what I said, um, and so it's not just Dr. Robinson who thinks it, um, which um, I think may happen from time to time. So you may have heard the saying that when America gets a cold, African Americans get pneumonia. This pandemic has shown many people the disparities that exist as a result of multi-generational lack of access, multi-generational trauma, and our failure as a public education system to correct um, the, the academic achievement gaps caused by the educational debt. So as we move forward, I would ask that after safety, we also keep equity in mind. And so with that thought in mind, I want to be clear, as I have said before on the public record, we need to not only transform our curriculum, but we also need to make sure we're setting aside some of our CARES dollars to have supplemental education on the other side of this pandemic to help students catch up. Those that we've left behind historically and those that have fallen further behind because of the COVID-19 slide and then the summer slide. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, board members, I've attached a, my report to the agenda uh, in that section of the report. There's just a couple of things I'd like to point out to all of you that's on the report. Um, I wanna point out some of the events that I, uh, that I was involved in to represent the board as a whole. Over the past six days, I've been interviewed, I've been in live interviews with WPTC reporter, Ryan Hughes, WPBF reporter, Angela Rozier, Telemundo reporter, Adrian Criscott, WPEC reporter Chuck Weber. I've been interviewed by the Palm Beach Post reporter Andrew Marr and Sun Sentinel reporter Austin Erblatt, the Tallahassee Office of Political. And finally, I started off today this morning at eight o'clock with a live radio interview on local station WFTL with Jennifer Ross. It's been interesting to hear their questions and I have tried to ensure that all the views that all of you have shared at our board meetings were included in my comments to the press. Uh, finally, I also recorded a message on behalf of the board uh, at the Education Network to be given to the summer school graduates tomorrow. And I, like Dr. Fenoy and, the, and the, all, all of you that have mentioned already, I congratulate all of our graduates, the 200 students who will be graduating tomorrow. Um, yesterday, I also had a very constructive phone conversation with Dr. Alina Alonzo. Dr. Alonzo has assured me that she is available to provide us with any info the district may need to make decisions affecting the health of our students and staff. And I thank Dr. Alonzo for her, um, for, for her help in that regard and, and her promise to help us as we move forward with this, uh, with this uh, problem that we all share at, the, at this time. Um, one last thing, unless the governor extends the uh, virtual meetings, uh, um, Mrs. Bass will have, to, uh, will have to put on the agenda that's gonna be published this week for the next meeting, uh, whether or not we're gonna be here live uh, in August uh, if she publishes the August meeting. Um, we have no meetings the first two weeks in August. So far, there's nothing on the calendar, but we do have meetings the last two weeks in August. So 
unless the governor extends, you're probably going to be getting a call from someone, probably the board clerk, asking whether um, you, you're you're willing to come in here. And um, if he extends, it's not an issue. Um, but you're still going to get a call wondering. You, you all had indicated that in August you'd like to come back. That was before the pandemic uh, got more serious here in Palm Beach County. So um, if the governor extends, you know, you'll be asked if you still want to come back in August for the meetings or want to stay out. If the governor doesn't extend, we don't have any choice. I, I suppose we're going to have to all be back in here. And, uh, and school police has been working on um, the protocols and to make sure that we all have, uh, we're as safe as possible. You can't see it, but there's a uh, plexiglass between all the board seats at the moment, uh, except for the ones right next to me. They kept those out till after these meetings are over with, but we have the plexiglass here and, and there's already plans on how we'll be situated in the room. Mrs. Rico, I saw your hand. Did you have something you wanted to say? No? All right. Um, the only other thing I have is we have the in memoriam. We have three three employees that have passed away. Um, Eusebio Goya, sorry, Goya Ghana, a lead custodian at Yega Middle School. He was born in April 27, 1944, and passed away on June 15, 2020. Cindy Radoff, teacher, elementary, kindergarten, UB Kinsey, Palmview Elementary. She was born July 10, 1965, and passed away May 19, 2020. And Eric Reed, teacher, middle English six to eight, John F. Kennedy Middle, who was born October 14, 1984, died May 18th, 2020. We can have a moment of silence for those individuals and their families. Thank you, board members. Um, we have uh, no government report, uh, student government report, of course. Uh, we have committee reports, academic advisory committee. Uh, Mrs. Bass, I don't see anything attached. Are they here present tonight? No, I don't have anything from them. The other three are attached. Okay, so the audit committee uh, report is attached, construction oversight review committee and the district diversity and equity committee. Their, their reports are all attached to our agenda. Um, we do have some speakers, elected officials and delegates and I don't have the list in front of me. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bass, can you tell me who those individuals are? I believe it's Mr. Let me just say, I think it's Mr. Katz, Mr. Gavrilos, um, the PTA, Mrs. Fellman, and the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. Name escapes me, I'm sorry. That's Jackie Calloway. Uh, we will be hearing from Ms. Fellman from the Palm Beach County PTA, James Gavrilos from the Ed Foundation, and Jacqueline Calloway, the vice chair of the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. We do not have Mr. Katz today. And these will all come in uh, via recording. Okay, and we and we have some other agenda speakers also? We have two in-house agenda topic speakers, uh, Mr. Molly and Ms. LeCompte. They should be in-house. Okay, all right, so we'll start with the uh, with the four, uh, with the three recorded messages, Mr. Mr. Cavon, Mr. Ramasar, would you start those? Good evening, Dr. Fenori, Chairman Barbieri, school board members and staff. My name is Laura Fellman. I'm honored to speak with you tonight as the president of Palm Beach County Councils of PTAs, PTSAs. County Council, along with local units in Palm Beach County, have been working during these summer months to prepare for the upcoming school year. And we just attended Florida PTA's first virtual leadership convention. We enjoyed expanding our horizons, trainings, and advocacy efforts all from our own homes. We were especially proud to celebrate the installation of Palm Beach County's very own Jen Martinez as Florida PTA president. During our convention, Florida PTA passed two resolutions which will help us to expand our advocacy efforts. The first focuses on chronic absenteeism. With this resolution, Florida PTA will be working to build awareness about chronic absenteeism and to advocate for consistent definitions of absence and attendance during non-crisis and during crisis periods such as a pandemic or post-hurricane, as well as consistency in the data collection throughout the state. With this data, we will work together to understand chronic absence in our communities, find solutions, and help to develop policies which will support every child's attendance during non-crisis and crisis periods. 
The second resolution focuses on culturally insensitive school names and mascots. An often overlooked component of race and racism is the impact of school names and symbols on the school culture and shaping the identities of students, teachers, and their communities. These memorializations normalize stereotypes and reinforce systemic racism, thereby producing toxic learning environments for students and educators. Florida PTA calls for and supports the renaming of schools which have culturally insensitive names, the replacement of school mascots which are culturally insensitive, and Florida PTA advocates for school community and stakeholder input in the renaming and replacement process. Looking ahead, Palm Beach County Council is excited to host a virtual meet and greet the school, the school board candidates on August 4th. If you're interested in attending, please email me at palmbeachcountypta at yahoo.com to request the registration. We will also be hosting our meetings and trainings virtually at the beginning of this school year for our volunteers. I would like to take a moment to thank the school board and staff regarding the time and energy you spent making the very difficult decision about the reopening of schools and the school calendar. As per National PTA's recently released position statement on reopening schools, it is our association's position that plans for reopening shall incorporate the best available science and the expertise of infectious disease doctors and health practitioners. Plans should also strictly follow the most up-to-date Center for Disease Control guidelines, including but not limited to reasonable social distancing, rigorous sanitizing processes, and viral screening and testing protocols. And lastly, I would like to invite each of you to join PTA, either in a Palm Beach County Schools PTA, through Florida PTA Sunshine State PTA, or in Florida PTA's newly formed Special Education PTA. By joining, you will be adding your voice to help make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children. Thank you again. James DeVillis, Education Foundation of Palm Beach County under the delegates and elected officials portion of the agenda. Chairman Barbieri, as we have now completed our fiscal year, I wish to highlight two areas in my monthly report to the board tonight. I'll focus on red apple supplies and our go teach classroom grants. In the previous academic year, we served 53 Title I schools who had 93% of their students on free or reduced lunch. In August, before any of us had ever heard of COVID-19, we provided backpacks to over 4,000 students in Pahokee and Bell Glade. We partnered with the Welcome Center to provide backpacks and supplies to students who relocated to Palm Beach County from the Bahamas after the devastation of Hurricane Dorian. Following the decision of March 13th to shift to distance learning, the Ed Foundation pivoted to a new reality. We immediately raised $130,000 to purchase Chromebooks for eligible students and launched Kits for Kids, a program that ultimately distributed $94,000 in school supplies to our students. All told last year, Red Apple Supplies distributed $656,000 in school supplies serving over 38,000 students in the county. As we move into the new academic year, we are adding 10 new schools, bringing the number to 63. We will be serving 63 schools who have 89% of their students receiving a free or reduced lunch. Our goal is to keep adding schools and lowering the threshold until every school and every teacher in Palm Beach County is being served by that office supplies. More importantly, as we address the new reality of social distancing, Red Apple Supplies is converting to a, an online ordering system this year. Our teachers will register online, they will actually shop online, and the supplies will be pulled by foundation staff and volunteers, box, and the teachers will have two options. They can either drive to Red Apple Supplies, and the boxes will be placed in their cars using contactless delivery, or we will be delivering to the schools, and the teachers can then pick up their supplies and distribute to the students. Secondly, I'd like to address the Go Teach Tax and Grants program. I know many teachers are paying attention and participating in the meeting tonight. The grant process and applications are now available and the process is open. You can go to the Education Foundation website, download the application, and turn it in as soon as you can. Individual teachers can receive a grant of up to $1,000, and a collaborative effort you can receive a grant of up to $1,500. We're excited to announce this year a new opportunity four Go Reach grants in the amount of $3,000 will also be awarded. 
to help you with your process on Monday, August 3rd at 3 p.m. and then again on Thursday, August 13th at 9 a.m. Education Foundation staff will conduct a seminar via Zoom helping the teachers with their grant application. For further information, please reach out to us at our website and specifically request information from Jennifer, Jennifer Eckerd, Director of Program and Grants. We hope every teacher in Palm Beach County will apply for a great teacher grant this year. Finally, to the seven members of the school board, Dr. Tremoy and your command staff. There are no simple solutions to this Gordian knot you have been handed and asked to untie. Former football coach Lou Holtz once said, if I walked on water, people would complain that I can't swim. No matter what you decide, you will be criticized by some. But well, we at the Education Foundation salute you and your leadership during these months. Contrary to what many believe, there is neither preparation nor training for the challenges you have been asked to address and solve. Challenges to which you have brought the only weapons at your disposal, your incredible intellect, your vast experience, and above all, your personal integrity and commitment to the young and Palm Beach County is the better for having you on the bridge leading us through this nightmare. We are your education foundation, serving the needs of the students, teachers, and Good afternoon, Chairman Fabieri, school board members, and Superintendent Fanoy. My name is Jacqueline Calloway, and I am vice chair of the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. I want to first thank you for making the decision to push back the opening of school for two weeks to allow additional time and planning for our teachers receiving to receive professional development. For years, the coalition has stressed the need for the district to carry out with fidelity the infusion of African and African American history as required by state statute. The full implementation of distance learning will present many strains on the school district. It is imperative, however, that the infusion of African and African American history is neither sidelined or marginalized. In recent months in our country, events have taken place that bring to the forefront the dire need for why infusion is critical in our schools. The murder of George Floyd, the resulting social unrest, and most recently, the move to dismantle and take down symbols of the Confederacy, monuments and statues, Confederate flags from government buildings and statues on military bases that pay homage to those who enslaved Africans in America. The names of, of traitors on bridges, such as the Edmund Pettus Bridge, on which the late Congressman John Lewis was nearly beaten to death on a day that was later to be referred to as Bloody Sunday. Edmund Pettus was an enslaver of black people who represents the worst of America. And the late John Lewis represents the best of this nation. Yet most Americans know nothing about either of these men. Why is this? Perhaps it is because the full and unadulterated truth of this country's history and the meaning behind those truths are not taught with fidelity in the nation's schools. This lack of true infusion denies all children, black and white, the opportunity to have the knowledge needed to engage in conversation, reflection, and critical thinking by examining the actions and words of previous generations. In part, it explains the dichotomy between the fact that even those white people who support Black Lives Matter still think that it is a bridge too far to take down these Confederate symbols of racism and white supremacist ideology, these enslavers of black people, these traitors whose sole purpose was to engage in the Civil War to keep slavery intact. This exists in large part because schools have failed in educating generations of black and white students earnestly in black history, black history which is the pure history of our country because it exposes this country's original sin, and that is the enslavement of Africans in America. I say these things to you as a reminder that even with the challenges of distance learning instruction, you cannot and must not diffuse the infusion of African and African-American experience in the curriculum. To do so 
would result in the miseducation of black students in their white cohorts as well. Thank you so very much. Hey, board members, that, that's the end of our delegate speakers. We have four uh, agenda speakers and I'm gonna call on the ones that are here in the building first. Uh, Mr. Mal, would you please come up to the podium? And uh, in, in after that, Ms. LeCompte, if I said your name right, Jennifer. Good evening, uh, my name is Randy Molly, and I spoke last week and I'm here obviously to speak again this week. First, I wanna thank the board for their decision last week, which hopefully will be approved tonight to extend the school year, push it back. I think that's the right decision. It was interesting to hear Mr. Barbieri speak to all the interviews that he's done over the last week. I too have done many interviews, including the one I just did with Channel 5 and the one that will air on Channel 12 tonight at six o'clock. Interestingly though, no one from the board has reached out to me in regards to all the emails that I've sent, all the requests that I've put out there. That does dishearten me. I would hope to have heard from someone by now. I'm here tonight to speak on compromise. I think we have a unique opportunity tonight to reach a compromise. As you know, my goal is to get our children that are, have IEPs that are in the ESE program back into school. I think we have an opportunity to do that. I also think that we can all agree that virtual learning is not the answer for those with IEPs. It cannot be an individualized program if their only option is virtual. It won't meet the statutory requirements. We all know that. We talked last week about the changing of the IEPs, meeting with the parents. Those changes, while they may meet some type of virtual goals, will most certainly not meet the goals of the children that have IEPs. As we sit here tonight, there's a unique opportunity for compromise. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that there are lawsuits pending. Many, many people have looked into suing. On the flip side of that, you've got school boards that are trying to protect themselves, teachers unions trying to protect themselves from lawsuits, both on a state and federal level. The last thing any of us want is any more of our tax dollars going towards lawsuits that could be avoided. Tonight, you have the opportunity to avoid those lawsuits. If you simply amend the rule before it goes up to FDOE, to include ESE classes and anyone with an IEP, the choice to go in person during phase two. I'm not asking for anything on August 31st. What I am asking is on phase two, you just amend that tonight, send that up to FDOE to include ESE classes and students with IEPs in phase two. And you will have met the compromise that I think we all want to see tonight. You can avoid more tax dollars being spent on lawsuits. You can avoid having to defend yourselves when there's no need to do that. That's all I'm asking for. And that's all I want. I think that's a logical conclusion that we can all come to. Thank you. Mr. Molly, just so you know, we don't normally re respond, but I, I wanna tell you that we do have a board discussion item on the agenda for tonight. This specifically, my attempt putting it there was specifically to discuss the ESE students so if you just watch the meeting later, um, you'll see that the board members that I know I'm not alone. I've heard that some of the other board members, probably all of them, we can't talk to each other outside of these meetings, have issues also with that. So I'm sure that you'll hear quite a bit of discussion later on about that, that situation. So thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. LeCompte, would you please come up to the podium? And if I mispronounce your name, I'm sorry. Would you tell us what your name is when you come up there? All right, I've been advised by uh, by IT people that uh, that she is not here. So we'll take the, uh, uh, Mr. Ramasar, would you play the two recorded agenda speakers, Amy Spielman and David Canfield, please? Hi, my name is Amy Spielman. I have two daughters in the Palm Beach County School System, and I am asking that you vote against delaying the start of the school year. Ending in June will interfere with all summer plans and programs. And it also puts Palm Beach County behind all the other counties nearby like Broward County and all the Southern states. They are all starting before us and ending before us. So this will interfere with all next summer plans. And I think these kids have suffered enough 
period. In addition, they need to get back into school. They need to get back into their routine, even if it is virtual. And on the computer, they need to start speaking with friends and being involved in learning and reading and math and everything and putting it off another three weeks is not gonna make any difference in COVID. We just need to get these kids back in their routine. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Canfield. I'm calling regarding um, item 17 under new business, ELR1 school calendar year uh, 2020 to 2021. Again, my name is David Canfield. My children attend Boca Raton uh, Community High School. I'm calling to urge the uh, board members to keep the current calendar year or only push it back uh, maybe a week. Um, for graduating seniors uh, attending the University of, uh, or I should say the Florida University uh, system for college, uh, about a third of graduating seniors have to attend the summer session, which starts mid-June. Uh, for example, this year, um, the classes start on uh, Monday, uh, Monday, June 22nd with, with housing um, the Friday prior to that, uh, move, you know, move into the housing, the dorms, the Friday prior to that, uh, and that would be on June 19th. Well, this year they don't have any because of the COVID, but it's the same for every year. Uh, so by pushing the calendar year back to, uh, to end on uh, June 18th, as, as proposed, the students would literally be finishing their last day of school on Friday, moving into the dorms that same day and attending their first day of college on Monday, the, on the following Monday. Uh, this is not uh, right or, or acceptable for, for parents with seniors graduating attending the Florida University system. Again, I've already experienced this with my older child and uh, many of her friends um, attended the, the summer sessions. Uh, this would include Florida State, University of Florida, University of Central Florida, University of South Florida, uh, et cetera. Um, so please consider the graduating seniors and the fact that they will have no summer or no time in between the end of the uh, academic school year for Palm Beach County and the start of their summer session for college. I urge you to keep the calendar year um, you know, as it normally would be, or maybe move it back a week, but not, uh, not as much as you are proposing. Again, my name is David Canfield. My children attend Boca Raton Community High School. Thank you. Hey, board members, that's all this, uh, the, the agenda speakers we have. We have some non-agenda speakers that we'll take later at the appropriate time. Um, at this point, we have items to go to. Is any, do any board member want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Seeing none, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? Dr. Robinson? No, I'm sorry, there must be like a delay. I was actually seconding the motion. Okay, um, there's no further discussion. All, all in favor, opposed, motion carries 7-0. Uh, first item under new business uh, is B2, Mr. Superintendent. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Let me make sure I get it right this time. I recommend the board approve the advertisements of the FY21 tentative district summary budget and the appropriate tax notices in accordance with the Florida statute 200.065. Motion by Mrs. by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Next item, Mr. Superintendent, is ELR1. Yes, sir. I recommend the board approve the revised calendar for school year 2020-2021. Motion by Mr. Vice Chairman Shaw, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Under discussion, the only thing I'd like to say, first of all, is I, I appreciate the fact that the district worked out the calendar to make sure that um, 
the, that we had the, the best possible solution. But I, I want to just address Mr. Canfield that was just here. Um, Mr. Superintendent, don't the seniors finish well before the rest of the, of the students? So there won't be that problem because the kids that, um, I, get, I think he's thinking that all our children that leave on June 18th of 2021 are going to include the seniors, but the seniors are all gone by then, aren't they? Typically gone? Yes, in most instances, they usually leave around graduation, but I think uh, Mr. Mr. Oswald can speak specifically to how it happens here in Palm Beach County. Yes, they usually finish up about uh, about two weeks prior. Okay, so um, if, if somebody can get back to Mr. Canfield and just let him know, I don't want him to think we ignored his request, but his, his children that are seniors in high school would be able to basically they'll have a couple weeks before they have to check in at the at the university that he's sending them to um mrs andrews you had your hand up go ahead yes thank you and i'm just uh, happy to see this uh, calendar for uh, august 31st as i said before hopefully that we're going to be moving into phase two soon we're really in a bad in bad shape right now but i want to thank all the people from the calendar committee i mean you all really got together and did a great job in working together and especially the SEIU, you know, our bus drivers, our custodians, there's gonna be a little gap for them before they get their first paycheck, but they understood the seriousness of this issue as it relates to uh, the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus situation and how it's impacting all of us. And they work together to come up with a unified decision to go with August 31st. So kudos to everybody working together. Thank you. This is Whitfield. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to talk about the preschool days for teachers. Um, I um, am also very happy with this calendar. I think it's wonderful. I like that we are um, trying to push back the start date because I do think that gives us the time that we need to just make this um, time in virtual as amazing as we can. And also for maybe the numbers to even start coming down, which would just be wonderful, I think, for everyone. Um, but I want to make sure that if our teachers or our principals feel that they need additional days for preschool. I know there's a very steep cost with it, um, $4 million a day, but um, if they want it, not that I want it, if they want it, um, I wanted to know that I would support that um, going forward. And I wanted to see what my fellow board members felt like about adding two more days to preschool so that um, our teachers can have a more of an opportunity to reach out to students and um, to, um, you know, better prepare uh, for this new learning environment that, um, you know, we have to uh, get even better at. So I wanted to just put that out there. Mr. Chairman, um, after the board is finished with their comments, um, our team is ready to present. Uh, Mr. Oswald and his team are ready to present a solution. All right. So there are several board members who want to speak. Would you like Mr. Oswald to move forward on that to presentation before? I had Ms. Brill, Mrs. Andrews. No, Ms. Brill, you want to speak? Go ahead. And then uh, Dr. Robinson, you okay with waiting or you want to speak after Ms. Brill? Ms. Brill, if you want to make your comments before Mr. Oswald, go ahead. Actually, I'm going to wait. Okay, Mr. Oswald, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Fanoy. Good evening again, board members. We have been meeting with some principals as well as with the regional instructional superintendents to look at the preschool calendar. calendar. If the board would support, we would support two additional days to the preschool calendar. That would have to, and uh, Ms. Uh, Vicki Prey can jump in, but we would negotiate that with Classroom Teacher Association, two additional days to address uh, a number of the issues that came up last week to ensure that all of our families um, have been contacted by our teachers to ensure that they're set up. In addition, to give our teachers additional time to set up their Google Classrooms, as well as if they're going into their regular classroom to teach from their classrooms. Also the additional training and professional development that's being rolled out, including um, that are dealing with trauma, mental health, and the racial issues that are going on in our country. Those two additional days, um, as well as a lot of conversations have been going on around our English language learners and our individuals with uh, IEPs. We want to ensure that our teachers have additional time to address those uh, IEPs and how they will address those in a distance learning environment with the ESE staff on a school campus, um, as well as everything else that we do normally during a regular uh, preschool week. 
Thank you, Mr. Roswell. Ms. Bro, you were next, then Dr. Robinson, then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and, and maybe I should go last because I do have a question for legal. So I'll, I'm just going to defer till everybody's done. Uh, Mr. Barbieri, uh, Mrs. Bass told me that my camera is off. I don't show it off on my computer. Okay, Ms. McQuinn, we see, we see a big B. So if you want to speak, you're just going to have to let me know verbally so that I know that you want to speak. Are you in line to speak at this I have, point? Yeah, I've had my hand up since the, since the item began to be discussed. So um, yeah, I would. Thank you. Okay. It's short. I got you on the list. I totally understand how people feel about virtual learning, by the way. Um, <laughs> I have to say it, I've held it off a long time. I'm being a little repetitive with those who have thanked staff, but I am so appreciative of Dr. Panoy's staff. And in this particular instance regarding the calendar under the leadership of Mrs. Evans Parade, they came to us with solutions and they did it in just a couple of days. They didn't say why we can't do something, but how we can. And they even gave us options to look at. Our unions, instead of saying, I have to have everything my way, they said, we're very appreciative because I asked the staff, I, they said, we're very appreciative that we're getting paid. We know we can't all have every want. So, so very, very um, happy that we are the school system that I know we are, but it's just great to see this come together. And then I would like to make sure that, um, I make my rationale for initially requesting the delay very clear. We are opening virtually because of the virus. My rationale for asking then, since we're open virtually, that we open later is so that our students have less time learning virtually. So I just wanna make that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McQuinn. Uh, Dr. Robinson. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, I actually agree with Mrs. McQuinn and that's why I supported the delay before. But, um, and as I said last week, I wanted additional preschool time uh, because, you know, this is a brand new day. It, everything's new. You know, people talk about the new normal, but it's not normal and people need to get ready for it. So um, I want to thank Mr. Oswald for, um, you know, embracing this, um, this conversation, not, not just for me, but I know many of the educators as well have um, shared the need for more time. I just want to mention a number of things that I don't think have been said that need, we need to prepare for. So one, I believe each and every employee needs to have education about COVID-19. What is known, what appears to be true, common misunderstandings and et cetera. And then how this causes your way of work to be different. Because it's one thing if you tell somebody, for example, six foot distancing, it's another thing if they understand the science behind that recommendation. Number two, um, as Mr. Oswald um, alluded to, you know, we had to be prepared to address the social emotional needs of our children who are coming back after being isolated and after watching on um, the social upheaval um, in our community. Um, but we can't do that unless we provide time and space for the adults to unpack their feelings around this pandemic and social change. And so, and I also want to say we need to make sure school police are involved in that as well. Um, in addition, as we start developing, or I shouldn't say start developing, I know they're in process, as the protocols are defined, um, staff needs additional time to, to embrace them and, and see what does that really mean for their day to day? Like, how are we going to wash hands, for example, every two hours, which I really hope is part of our protocol. Additionally, 
the school-based educators in, during preschool need to reach out to every family um, to determine their needs, to make sure they had their device internet, determine the best communication methodology, surveys or saying text, but maybe not for that individual parent. And, and to, just to get the school year started off right, because it's, it's going to be stressful enough um, without having a good working relationship between the family and the, and the school. So we need to make sure teachers have much more extensive training on all the features of Google Classroom, Google Meets, and the rest of the entire Google Suite. And, and I want to thank um, Ashley um, Diana Fetterman um, for um, having a conversation with me earlier today about the preschool training that's already in progress and reminded me about our trailblazers. But I have to say it's very important that we have um, teachers who found distance learning to be a pleasurable challenge, who were energized by it and did a good job for them to work with teachers who did not find it to be such a pleasurable challenge. And so that everybody's doing better. I know that our educators want to do an outstanding job and we need to give them the time and space to do it. Additionally, the schools need time to organize the consumables and other supplies and the packets for the students that um, they will then take and use at, at home home as part of their distance learning. And we need to make sure we have an equity framework in mind when we're doing that. We need to have kindergarten orientation uh, for parents and students. And the other thing is, unless we're going to schedule time um, when we see ourselves moving from stage one to stage two, we need to do a lot of front end work in preparation for stage two, meaning classroom teachers need to be able to go into their classrooms and set up their classrooms in preparation for students coming back in the partial reopening. And then to t have all the conversations about how things will run at their school. Then that way, when the numbers are such that we can go to stage two, there is just a refresher and, and a tweaking. And lastly, I want to say, and I don't want to leave out um, the social emotional um, professionals, so our behavioral health professionals, mental health professionals, case managers, and co-located services need to have training. They need to then help the adults unpack the issues that I, I mentioned in terms of um, the isolation, the pandemic, as well as how they are processing um, social change. And also, I hope that we will work with all intentionality to have each one of these um, behavioral health, mental health case managers um, trained in restorative justice processes. So now is the time if we have additional days of professional de development that not only can we um, respond to the challenge caused by the pandemic, but we can go back and retrieve those things that we knew we wanted to do to improve how we deliver education and provide support for our children and adults, and we can get them done too. So I'm still um, looking at an additional week of preschool. I hear some talk about two days. I'm not sure that that will meet all the needs, um, but I'll take two days if I can't get a week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Mrs. Andrews, you were next. Thank you, and uh, certainly I'm happy to hear for the teachers and the other support uh, staff that's going to actually help our children and be ready. But I'm also concerned about the um, the non-instructional, our support people, our custodians. I mean, this is a new way of life for them too. I know they've been working all summer to change uh, the process of these schools with retrofitting and, and just doing a whole lot of different kinds of work. And I want to make sure that they're getting the training that they need. Uh, I just remember that some of the uh, facilities when they were there, there was very little internet access for them to go through training. And I don't know if they actually have uh, that kind of um, support in their home. So I just want to make sure that as we ask and expect for them to step up to the plate to rearrange how our schools are going to look, uh, our buses are going to look, that we make sure that they get some additional training too. And lastly, I was going to ask Mr. Oswald or Mr. Burt, as we talk about these additions here, I just really still don't want anybody to lose any of their salary. So as we talk about adding here and there for, for the professional development, I love it. But I really think right now I want to make sure that no one is penalized with their uh, financial and their salary. So if somebody could answer that, for sure. Uh, 
Um, hi, this is Mike. Good evening, board. This is Dr. Fenoy. Um, yeah, no one's going to be penalized. Everyone will still be paid their full salary. Uh, the issue, I think, as was mentioned earlier with the calendar, because we're shifting to start of school three weeks, we have about 4,000 employees that are going to have to wait a little longer for that first check of the new school year. Uh, so these, these employees include uh, bus drivers, bus attendants, school food service workers, uh, police aides, paraprofessionals. Uh, they normally, you know, they're 22 pay employees. So they always go during the summer, they go through a drought of no paychecks. And typically th that span is about eight weeks from the, their last check of the prior school year until they get their first check in a new school year. Uh, with this calendar change, they're now going to have 10 weeks uh, to make it through the summer without a check. So normally they would have got a check on August, August 21st. They'll now get their first check on September 4th but they will be paid, you know, their full salary to work this school year. Uh, so I, I hope Ms. Sanders that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, just can I follow up, Mr. Barbieri? Go ahead, Mrs. Sanders. I, I just want to make sure that if they're going to get some additional uh, staff development training too, I don't want them to lose out uh, on any money. So how does it work if, if there's something special that they need to do to get ready for this uh, new so, well, my thought on that was because it looks like we'll be opening in a distance learning environment, um, we're going to be, we'll have some time to work with these folks under their normal calendar um, where they're not going to be maybe driving a bus, but we may be able to do some training and have them help us with other, other jobs around the district. So I feel like those groups are kind of covered, right? They, we've, we can probably work within their existing uh, contract and their existing schedule. If you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, so that those trainings have already been designed. And so Mike is absolutely right. We, with us, with the board approving us going distance learning, we will schedule. They actually have pre in-service days already built in prior to the first day of school. So we, we have all that ready to go. Ms. Bro, did you still want to go last because uh, Mr. Shaw wants to speak and I had comments. Do you want to speak now? Um, I'll actually speak management I, because I suspect my questions will, um, will be to, to delay that portion. But I do want to say that um, I was, even though I, there's a lot of feedback. I don't know who's, uh, someone's microphone. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. So um, what I was saying was that, you know, everybody knows I've always wanted to start late. Uh, I won't belabor that. I was comfortable with the 24th until I learned about the distribution of devices, which really swung me right over to supporting the 31st. Um, I think, though, that the teachers, yes, they do need more time. We have to all remember they also never closed out their classrooms when they left. You know, everybody left suddenly. And the additional thing that I'm requesting, and I brought it up in my meeting with staff, is that the parents need to be able to access their children's classrooms to get their children's belongings. So all of that can be done during the preschool time. What I wanted to ask legal is, and I suspect we'll have to bring it back, but I don't want to do a discussion where we can't vote. I wanted to offer an amendment, if possible, that we would not start school in the future any later than the fourth Monday in August. And the reason being, you know, now we've already set the pattern. The reason in the, the rationale in the past when the, our constituents asked was that we would be having to deal with a pay gap and that would be an issue. Um, but it would put us more in line with other districts and other states along the Eastern coast. So since we're already at that point and at that place, I would like us to consider that. So for legal to Ms. Rico, can we amend this or do I need to have that brought back separately? I, I think that would be um, something you'd bring back separately because that's going to future calendars and we do have a policy on the calendar. It does have um, also impact on the various provisions in the bargaining agreements that govern the calendar and the participation in the calendar committee, et cetera. So I think that's something that needs some further thought and also to be brought back. So then just as a follow-up, Mr. Barbieri, um, if I bring that back as a discussion item, um, I, we won't be able to vote on it, right? So we can give direction at that point to the superintendent. So I would just say that we will, for Mrs. Bass to make a note 
that at the next meeting as a discussion item, I would like to bring back a discussion of starting school no later than the fourth Monday in August. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Mr. Shaw and then Mrs. Whitfield. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I just several things that I'd like for us to consider. Um, this is this is prospective totally because we're not sure where we're going to be in a few months. But I would like to suggest that staff begin conversations now with the health department um, to find out that if and when we get a vaccine and it's appropriate and could be worked out, that we consider allowing um, the health department to do the vaccinations or the administration of the vaccines at school centers for staff and students. Um, back in a, a previous century when I was in school and we received our polio vaccines, it was given by the health department in school. And I know there are a lot of issues that would need to be dealt with to do this, but I think this is, this is one of those issues that's gonna take a very significant effort by the entire community uh, to address this. And I think it's worth consideration. It's not asking that we do anything at this point, but I do think it should be something that should be on the radar screen to consider. Another issue is as we do move forward, I would like to, to know and see what kind of options we have because we've talked about our bus drivers and our cafeteria workers and uh, our paras to see what kind of opportunities, what kind of opportunities we can give to them so that when they do come back, they're doing a, a, a productive um, uh, position. And I know that in my conversations with the two cities I mentioned earlier, uh, one of them is actually using some of our employees during their summer camp programs, and they've offered to continue um, using them in the, in the uh, programs that they're trying to create. And I think there's some creative ways that we need to reach out. We've got to think out of the box. I know there are issues that we need to deal with, with interlocal agreements and, and, um, and arrangements and, and those kinds of things. But I think it's important that we start that process now so that when we do start school, that we have uh, productive employment for opportunities for everybody who's who's in there. Um, this question is for the superintendent. I had tried to get on the Florida channel. Uh, the governor, I understand, has been having a news conference and school opening. And uh, Dr. Fenoy, has there been, did the governor say anything that would have any impact on, on the decision we're making? I, you know, I talked to, um, staff earlier and they think they were going to monitor that. So just, is there any update or is that kind of typical stuff? Thank we, you. We, uh, we, yeah, I think we were told that we should anticipate something big, but it, there is, there's no change for what the work of the board. Uh, I think his announcement was simply a reiteration that he <clears throat> understands that some parents don't want to go to school. He supports uh, school districts like ours pushing our calendar back. You know, but there was nothing uh, that impacts the work of the board today. Mr. Shaw, there's another thing that you said um, about vaccinations. I don't have the answer for that today. However, it was brought up yesterday at our eight, uh, health advisory committee meeting. Uh, so it's on our list of things to start digging into um, for the future. So thank you, sir. Mrs. Whitfield, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I, I have really had the similar comments to Ms. Brill. I wanted to make sure that um, the community understood um, that this vote tonight for the calendar is just for this year and that I would like to make sure that we have a, a fuller, richer, deeper discussion about um, moving it back um, if we decide to do that permanently uh, when we have a lot more time to think about it and not in a rush. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitfield. So board members, I, I know Ms. Sanders wants to speak also and I just want to um, if we're going to if we're going to add those two days of the calendar, uh, I, Mr. Sh Mr. Oswald, I understand that you told me earlier today that you've talked to some of the principals and, and they feel that the, the teachers need the extra couple of days. We're going to need an amendment to the motion on the floor to add those two days in. The superintendent's indicated he would support that. So, um, Mr. Oswald, can I, can you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can I jump in on this? I think yeah. because we're adding two days, um, I would like to have a discussion with the board real quick. Um, Miss uh, Miss Perey would still need to go back and talk to the unions because there's, there's some pieces of that. So we can either bring it back or I can just commit on the record that once we get that worked out, I will add that 
and then submit that with the plan on the 31st and then but work with the board before where i think we're scheduled to meet with you before the submission so i would put it in there and then work with and then let the board know that so either way we can either bring it back for a vote or we can um we can go let miss Perey start working with the unions by adding those two days and i'll just put it in the plan so it's, it's, it's the will and pleasure of the board <clears throat> Personally, I, I, you know, I, I'd rather not tell the public again that we haven't made a decision on something on the counter. So if we could just add that as an amendment tonight and then super, let the superintendent figure out where those two days will be added in that period of time. Uh, Mrs. Rico. My suggestion would be to go ahead and make the amendment and condition it upon the union's agreement. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> I got all a bunch of hands up. Just write them down. Hold on a minute. All right, if somebody got their hand up, want to make a motion, Mr. Shaw, okay. you make a motion. I move that we amend the um, the the recommendation as just stated. Do I have a second? By Ms. Brill. Go ahead, Mr. Shaw. Just and a quick. This is only for clarification. Um, I think we need to make sure that, that the public, when we get into calendar things, they get confused on all of the things that we get into. But this does not impact student attendance days. This is strictly a teacher work day uh, for training for teachers, not for all of the students. That's correct. That's what this motion does. It just changes yeah. it for teachers. Uh, is there any, I've got a bunch of people who want to speak. Does anybody want to speak on this amendment? Okay, all those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? The superintendent, the motion carries 7-0. So if you would work that out, all board members supported that extra two days. Can I, uh, procedural, Julianne, do I, ha I have to accept this motion, right? Or change? Yes. Okay. I, I formally accept this the amendment. Great. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Um, so I have some other hands up if you still wanna speak on. All right, so we, we've got the motion been approved uh, the the amendment. I also have Mrs. Andrews hand was up, Ms. McQuinn and Dr. Robinson. Do you still want to speak? I don't need to speak. Okay, Ms. McQuinn's done. Dr. Robinson, go ahead. Yes, I just want um, information that can be emailed to us about when each of the employed classifications will return to work under this. So, so like right now, my mind is on the behavioral health professionals, mental health professionals and case managers. As I'm understanding this, um, they will not they will not be included in additional two days. That's for um, classroom teachers only is how I'm hearing this. But I want to make sure that there is time allotted for our mental health, social, emotional support people to get the additional training that they need. So it can be it can be sent to me later. I think that I know the answers. I just want to be clear about it. Yes, ma'am, I'll have a uh, 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 deputy superintendent and his team submit that to the board in writing. Mr. Superintendent, the, the, the memo was for the additional teachers. Dr. Robinson, you just mentioned classroom teachers. Were those five days originally were there, did they include other teachers like the media center media specialists and those other people so we're clear on what we're adding two days to you understand my question the five days originally had yeah, that. i understand i think you're asking what employee groups come back at what time um, i don't know all of that on top of my head but what we, we can definitely get that to the board probably tomorrow i mean it's just probably just something to pull up so we can do that <clears throat> no i think i think my question mr superintendent is we just added two days for and dr robinson said classroom teachers but there are other teachers that we have other than classroom teachers like the media specialists and, and, and those okay. kind of people. So are, are they included in this amendment? I mean, you, I, 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 I Vicki on someone would have, I, I need someone else to answer. I'm not really sure. I can't answer that for you, sir. The convo, I, I am here, sir. It, um, it would involve anybody in the T bargaining unit, which would include speech language pathologists, audiologists, guidance counselors, media specialists. Okay, so this amendment, Ms. Bray, that included those people that are that were already in the five days. They've now got the extra two days that you're going to be working on. Put those. That's on correct. Time. Okay, Dr. Robinson. So I am I on? okay. So I just want to make sure that we all understood that. Um, 
I'm not going to to split hairs here, um, but I was I was really focused on the classroom teachers. I don't have any objections to the others, um, but I just want to make sure that that all of us that voted for the amendment realized it was for the whole bargaining unit. So, all right, is there any board member that didn't understand that it included the whole bargaining unit? Would would be the speech pathologist. If you if you if you didn't if you voted for it but you would not vote for it now knowing that please put your hand up. Okay. So. No, I just want a comment, please. I I agree that for me it is I assumed it was for the um, entire bargaining unit. If if we don't, the communication gaps with, for example, media specialists would become very problematic. I agree with you. Mrs. Andrews, go ahead. Okay, uh, if you can hear me. <laughs> Got some background noise in here. Somebody's at the door. Uh, mine is a little different. Uh, I just want to ask Dr. Fenari, as well as the rest of the board, um, have we actually looked at uh, whether we're losing teachers as we move forward with this calendar, moving it back to um, uh, August the 31st, uh, I think it's a good thing, but some people don't. So are we losing any teachers or employees? Are we keeping a record of that? Are we losing students to the private school or uh, to charter schools? Anybody keeping up with that as we move through all these processes? Maybe? Yes, ma'am, we are. We have um, the uh, HR team keeps track of everyone who has submitted resignations. Um, so far, we haven't had an abundance of those, but we're, we're monitoring that. In addition to students unrolling from the school district, we're in the middle of the registration process. So we'll have that data as soon as uh, the registration process continues. Okay. All right, so we, we, had, we, we, we have voted for the amendment. Now we need to, unless there's any further discussion, we need to vote on the whole motion to, for the calendar. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And that's the end of that item. The next item, Mr. Superintendent, is TL3. Yes, sir. I recommend, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir, go ahead, I'm sorry. I recommend the board approve the amendment to the Boys and Girls Club Clubs of Palm Beach County, Inc. at Gove Elementary School through September 30th, 2020, and authorize the superintendent or designee to sign all documents and amendments related to the agreement which are required for implementation. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. That takes us to board discussion items. Um, the first one is BD1. I added that on there. I wanted to discuss board policies and I wanna thank General Counsel's Office because we all have a, a copy of the policies that, that the General Counsel's Office feels that need to be either amended or added. Uh, to support policies we don't currently have. Um, and I know Mrs. Um, no, that's another one. So uh, Mrs. Rico, can you just um, give us briefly, you know, some summary information on what you gave us with the policies that need to be fixed? And you indicated that some of these should be done as emergencies and then work on replacing them with, with regular policies so we don't have to go through weeks of process on, on a regular policy. So could you opine on that please? Sure. Um, the board re received yesterday, probably late in the day, and I apologize for the lateness, um, a list of uh, board policies that we identified um, to align with the plan implementation. Um, we've reviewed these with Executive Cabinet um, and uh, Dr. Fenoy, Mr. Tierney, um, and uh, the leadership team in terms of moving forward to uh, work, work on these uh, items and bring them forward. Um, the suggestion would be as a, that they should be brought forward uh, initially as emergency items so that they can be quickly um, uh, implemented and uh, uh, and then work further to develop permanent policies as necessary. So I believe that a team is being assembled, um, project teams are being assembled to do just that and our our um, uh, legal team is you know available to support. I will add that you know a number of these, for instance, the people progression plan, um, the COVID employee protocols, uh, those have 
actually already been brought to the board as emergency items, you know, uh, when the pandemic first um, came up. And uh, this further emergency board board policies would be brought forward that would further expand on that work, further expand on those policies, um, refine and uh, tweak those uh, those protocols, et cetera, based on you know what we've learned and uh, to align with the plan. So I think that those are um, underway, but they would need to be brought back quickly. Any board member, other board members who want to uh, discuss that? So Dr. 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 Fenoy, are, so are you um, okay with working with the general counsel's office to bring those policies back to us? Did she's oh, we, we, uh, we talked about it this morning. Um, and I just want the board to understand the two open dates in August, I am intentionally leaving open so that we have time to start doing all of this work. I will call a special meeting if we have some stuff ready to go to get it out of, you know, so that you can, we can get it done. But that's why we're leaving those two weeks open so we can focus on as Julianne and her and, and Sean Bernard, let me be clear, Sean is all in right now. So we are working on these policies and aligning it with everything that goes to the state. So uh, yeah, we're, we're ready to go. We have a, a governance structure and a project plan to get this done for the board. Thank you, Dr. Fenoy. Uh, Vice Chairman Shaw, go ahead. This question is for Ms. Rico, um, and it, maybe we can talk about this, but I would like to say, you know, we're in the middle of this, this pandemic that created policies that we had to change simply because we never even anticipated something like this could ever happen. And I wonder if there, if it's feasible to have a school board policy that would enable um, staff to take some action on some of these things uh, and it would fit within the policy without having to write a brand new policy or modify a whole bunch of policies to get all of this in line. It seems like from practicality point, uh, I know that during the hurricanes, there's an agreement that the district has with the uh, emergency management and, and everything related to getting things done simply by getting them done because of, a, a, of an interlocal agreement. So I'd like for us to investigate whether or not there could be a broad enough policy written that would allow us to take some actions uh, based upon the situation without having to take the time of the board to sit and approve policies that in all reality, we're not ever going to turn down because there are things that have to be done in order for us to function. Thank you. Mrs. Rico. Sure. Um, and that's a great question. And I think that we did track a number of um, sort of emergency measures that are already either statutorily or by um, by education code rule available, like contractual, you know, purchases, et cetera, during an emergency. And then, you know, I, I, I think that there's a, a, a balance and we should certainly look at it, Mr. Shaw, when we when we um, take a look at these these implementation pieces, but also uh, when we when we can take a breath to uh, to see how going forward we could um, possibly pave some um, avenues for us to to be able to react uh, without immediately coming back uh, for these isolated issues. But um, this was certainly a new um, a new and challenging moment in our policymaking lives. So. Uh, we definitely um, were react in reactive mode, and I think it would be a great idea to look at some prospective uh, opportunities there. Thank you. I would also argue <clears throat> or suggest to all of us, I think with a, a name storm out there, <laughs> I hate to bring it up, uh, who happens to be have a name similar to someone on our executive team, and I'll leave that right where it is. But um, the question I do have is, you know, if we, you know, Lord forbid we find ourselves in that situation, how the policies overlap because you know we would essentially have two emergencies going on at the same time and so i you know i think that's something i mean I, as much as i don't want to talk about that i think we need to i know the teams have built all that stuff up but it's time for us to really discussing what happens because typically it's around august when we find ourselves in that situation thank you thank you mr Superintendent. mrs rico i think with all the work that's piling up you should probably reconsider you know leaving the <laughs> You're in good hands. We're making lists. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, thank you. 
The next item on, the, on for board discussion is COVID-19 procedures. And I know Dr. Robinson brought this up a few weeks ago with, the, with operational issues. I see Mrs. Andrews, and I didn't see yours before I put mine on Mrs. Andrews, has similar. So probably I'm gonna overlap and Mrs. Andrews certainly you can chime in with the other board members, but I just wanna make sure that we have you know, procedures in place and it ties into these policies I know, but um, I wanna make sure that we're not making decisions based on every situation, you know, we're gonna look at them as they occur and decide what we're gonna do. For example, a student gets COVID-19 in one of the classrooms, a parent has it at home and the kid comes to school and the kid doesn't have it. The, a teacher has it and she's been in the classroom with the kids all day. I mean, if, if those things occur, there needs to be a plan in place. And I'm not asking for the plan tonight, Mr. Superintendent, but uh, or, or Mr. Oswald, but I just want, I'm sure the other board members will opine on this also, but we need to make sure that, you know, because, you know, as soon as something happens in one of the schools, before the district even finds out about it, the parents find out about it, then it's on social media and the whole world blows up and all of us will get calls if it happens to be one of our schools. And so there's gotta be, the board members need to know what the plan is so we can calmly explain to the parents that are screaming on the other side of the phone about whether they're gonna send their kids to school the next day, what the procedures are. Dr. Robinson brought that up before. Mrs. Ann was bringing it up on her board discussion. I'm sure she has other things she like to talk about, but can we just get some assurances, Dr. Fenoy, that before the school year starts, or before we go to the 31st, that we're gonna have a plan that we can all see that, that the details, all of those procedures that are gonna be followed. Um, yeah, so not only will I assure you of that, the work has already begun. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and, and thanks to the general counsel for actually helping us create the roadmap so that we can tie these different decisions with the policies. Now, the devil is in the details, obviously. So as we get it, now, now that we have principals back in schools, we'll have other staff, <clears throat> and obviously other people around us are also coming up with some of these uh, policies and procedures as well. So I agree that we have to be consistent. We must be continue to be transparent and, and figure those pieces out. So we have work groups working on that now. Um, we will make it a point between uh, the deputy superintendent's team, the chief of staff's team, my team and operations, as we start to develop them, as you know, because the list is so long, every time we have one-on-ones with you, we'll update you on the newest things that we're putting in place. Conversations with the health advisory committee. Uh, we have a meeting with the county, I think on the 29th, to talk about how they can support us and what some of that might look like. So yeah, so all of that is in the atmosphere. We have works moving in that direction and I will commit that to the board. Okay, Mrs. Whitfield and Ms. Brill. Thank you so much. So um, I, it's interesting, uh, the procedures that you were talking about, I know are slightly different than what I was thinking of when I saw this item. But um, one thing that I think could be really helpful for the community is for us to also put down on paper the procedures that we're doing in reference to keeping the schools clean and protecting with like the air filters and, you know, the things that have been done, because I think there's a lot of confusion in the community about the specifics of what's happening. And I think a, a really strong communication um, that really shows what Ms. Paul's office has been doing all summer, um, uh, more than, than just a video, which I love the video, but I think um, people want more details on that as well, uh, especially as we're heading into phase two, they're gonna wanna know what has been done to protect their children. Yeah, those written plans are done. So we'll, we'll, I get, we'll have all that part of the, um, the final, we'll have it done. And that, that's the good news about the chief operating officers team. They've always been at work. So they've been, they've been, they've been documenting and changing along the way. So to the extent to which even the chemical levels and the new chemicals that we're using in those buildings and the Clorox electrostatic machines and the protocols around that. I even think if, if for the community, if you notice during our public speaking, when one, when one person walked out the back door, someone had cleaned off the podium. So those are the sort of things that we are working through every single day. So yeah, we'll get that to you. And I see Mrs. Andrews' hand went up and I know Ms. Brill, you're next. I'm sure that Mrs. Andrews we're in now in your board report discussion item because I know that that's some of the things I can tell you. I, I don't know if I'm off again, but I've been raising my hand for a while. So let me know if I'm on or not, please. Okay, Ms. McQuinn, you, you are actually frozen on my screen, so I couldn't see your hand. It's like you're, so I'll yeah, put your I figured. Ahead. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Brill, then Mrs. Andrews, then Ms. McQuinn. Thank you. So I appreciate this discussion item as well as the comments from Dr. Fenoy. This is such a fluid process and there are so many layers from what happens when a child gets sick, what happens when an employee gets sick, what happens, how do we set up our school buses, which I know is more operational. What I would love to see 
um, and this is to the superintendent and to the board, is that for every time we meet in person, we have an update. It's a COVID update with, because it is going to be fluid where Dr. Fenoy or staff can tell us, okay, this is, you know, we're addressing this area now, this is what we're doing because it's the cleaning me methods, it's the access, it's what do we do when people become ill. It's just so much information and so much detail. I just think it would be helpful to have a line item in our, in our board meeting, COVID update and allow the superintendent to share with us and for us to be able to have an exchange. No, I think that's a great idea. We actually implemented that recently. We brought, we bring in Paul Strauss and others to tell us what the latest information is. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that won't even be a problem at all. We'll, we'll, and then I think the only piece for the, there's some other things to discuss around when cases happen, you know, how, you know, keeping a track of that and making sure the board is aware where they're happening, um, you know, from, from my seat all the way down. What are our protocols gonna be if one of us goes out, blah, blah, blah. So I, yes, we'll, we'll, I'll be glad to do that. All right, Mrs. Andrews, go ahead. Dr. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Barbieri for bringing that up. And that was one of my questions too. The specifics, as I sit on the Council of Great City Schools and work with the Florida School Board, I've seen some of the plans that have gone into uh, Tallahassee, those who are actually, those districts that are actually going into brick and mortar, uh, they put those details out there as to how it's going to work. I think that's what we're waiting on. We want to see it and see how it works. But Ms. Burrell, I like the idea of each meeting that we get something, just like we have a hurricane manual that we update periodically uh, from year to year. But as we go through this, we may be going through this for a whole year. I don't know, I hope we won't. But as we work through this process, we need to have a manual as it relates to the pandemic and what we're doing in each area, i.e. the buses, school food service, the whole works. And those that actually uh, were actually opening their schools up brick and mortar, they had to write these plans up. And I've been looking at them and reading them and they're very detailed, as Dr. Fanoi knows. So as a result, I'm waiting for that information and we need to compile that. And guess what? It is fluid. It's going to change. So we want to make sure that we keep some type of portfolio and, and follow it so that we can kind of see what's going on. So when we're talking to people, we can actually speak intelligently about it. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ms. McQuinn, I think I you you spoke up before I saw Dr. Robinson's hand. So you're first, Ms. McQuinn, and then Dr. Robinson. Yeah, thank you. My hand was up very early. It froze again. I feel like that student in the classroom who becomes invisible and then drops out, but I'm not leaving. I just want, I've been holding off patiently. I have been reading the, um, as all of us have, the thousands of emails. And frankly, as soon as one, you answer one, four more come up, but I'm determined, but I am taking notes from the parents who are asking these kinds of questions about once we bring our kids back. So I, I, um, I plan to, I was going to wait until after tonight. Actually, I thought I'd wait until Monday, but I'm going to start sending all of those questions in so that staff can, has those in advance to bring to us. So I just want to give that heads up. I'm sure many of us are making copious lists. I've just been, been being patient until now. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Yeah, you're right. As soon as you answer one email, there's four more that are sitting there by the time you go back and look at your inbox again. So I think we're all in the same boat on that one. Dr. Robinson, go ahead. Thank you. So I think this is really good conversation. I agree that we should have a um, COVID-19 update at each meeting, but somehow I don't, I don't know. I don't just, I don't see it as being all that fluid. I think we just need to make some decisions and they need to be based in science. And so, and the reason I raised my hand was because when these plans come forward, I'm going to just warn everybody now, don't bring me a plan just because it has words there and it's detailed. I need, I need the references, right? I need, I need you to say we're using this kind of air conditioner because this study says blah, 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 okay? Because it means nothing to me. I don't know anything about this different air conditioning filters. So I need to have some authority um, that has expertise in this area set, guide us with that particular item, right? So I'm telling you now, I need more than a detailed plan. I need the detailed plan with references, okay? 
And, and again, it really does take me back, though, to the need to make sure that everybody, maybe even members of this board and leadership team, need to have some uh, overarching um, education about COVID-19 and the epidemiology and maybe had an opportunity to do Q&A. Because if you understand, if you understand the virus, what we do know about it, and what we what we know is not true, and what we believe to be true, then the decisions will make sense, right? And so I just want to be clear: it's not enough just to bring me a plan. I need a plan. I need to know it is based upon research, science. Um, and best practices, but those best practices need to be based in some science. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Um, any further discussion on this one? All right, the next one is uh, my board discussion item. Again, students included in stage two, and, and I've had lots of conversations, which I know all of you had with the, with the staff, but um, and we're all getting the same emails from parents that have ESE issues. And, and I just want assurances from the administration, since we are, we need to make sure those children are back in the classrooms, that they're included in stage, or what are we calling it? Phase two, which is the opening of school. So along with the kindergarten, first graders, sixth graders, ninth graders, I wanna see the ESE students brought back. It was certainly are given the parents the option of, of whether they want to send their children back. And if they don't, then let them waive it because it's a federal requirement that we have those children there. And also, I would also like to see us add the seniors because I'm sure all of you are getting issues from the seniors, questions from not only the seniors, but their parents. I, Fortunately, I, I know a lot of the seniors in my district because I go to those meetings in Boca High and Spanish River and Olympic Heights and West. And, and so they call me directly and they're very concerned, you know, and I understand their concern. I mean, if, if we open the schools and we're in phase two, on, on August 31st, then the seniors will be back on September 30th, four weeks later. But if we don't open until September, October, those seniors are not gonna be back until halfway through the year and they're concerned. They, they wanna meet with their counselors and you know, and they wanna help with their resumes and they, they, you know, they wanna make sure they participate in whatever extracurricular activities are there, uh, including you know, the clubs and all the other stuff to make sure that they can compete with all the other students in, in the country that are trying to get into our colleges. So. Um, I would just like to have a discussion on whether or not you will agree to include the ESC students in there as well as uh, as the as the seniors. And I see a whole bunch of hands, and I'm not sure which one I first. So right now I see a hand by Ms. McQuinn, and then Ms. Brill, and then Mrs. Whitfield, and Mrs. Andrews, and Dr. Robinson. Let me get those written down again. Ms. McQuinn, what did I say next? Ms. Brill, Ms. Mrs. Whitfield, Dr. Robinson, Mrs. Andrews. And Mrs. Rico, you trump them all because you're the general counsel, so you want to. Oh, sorry, I just I just wanted to frame um, the the discussion, I guess. And, and are you so? I don't want to interrupt you all's discussion, but in terms of you know asking for what is wanted, um, you know, this is a discussion item. So just line it up for whatever kind of future action, because I don't think there's an item on the table that uh, attaches to this particular item. I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Okay, I know other people had their hands up first, but you know, I've been pushed to the back of the line. So thank you for your patience. And I know that I'm going to get pushed back from this, but I just have to ask, um, <clears throat> Justin, please don't fall apart. So I would just like for us to think about, and maybe that's even in, three more, you know, after our kids come back, but before we're all back in the buildings. And I am referring specifically to our um, ESE students and um, deferring to our ESE department. And I just have to speak in regardless, regarding of how many parents have contacted all of us about students with autism. Please, they can sit in front of a computer and all day, okay, so, I know I'm stammering, but so I'm just so concerned about this. So maybe we would have in clusters, perhaps we would have um, some teachers 
who would want to report to some sites like clusters in clusters and receive some kind of hazard pay. And I'll just stop now, but I have to throw that out there. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Um, Ms. Brill. Thank you. And so Mr. Barbieri, I really appreciate your bringing up the conversation that I've wanted to have. I did speak to Dr. Fenoy this morning um, regarding ESC and I spoke to staff about the, the 12th graders, but we, we do need to narrow this down a bit because ESC is a very broad range. A child can have an IEP and just have speech and language and maybe, you know, doesn't, it may not be the same requirement um, that a child who's more profound has. So I don't know if we need to define what we mean by ESC. Um, definitely, of course, I understand about the children with autism because my son was nonverbal for many years and I get that. But then again, when he was older, he could sit in front of a computer. It's just he needed someone to redirect him because he had attention deficits. So, you know, there's, there is a whole range of ESC. So I would like to hear from the superintendent or staff on what they, what they feel um, is not doable. I mean, we're going to direct them, but, but just so you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of ESC students fully included in the regular classroom that have minimal assistance. And, you know, maybe they would benefit from being back with their entire class for example, my son's IEP goal was to be working with his regular, typical development, developmentally typical peers. Well, if he were to go back because he had an IEP, he would now be in what sort of would be a pullout situation, which would, for me, be a problem. So I think we need to hear from staff specifically on that, but I do support having um, ESC students the ones that we identify that should be back in that first group to go back, as well as the high school seniors for the many reasons that Mr. Barbieri brought up. Thank you. Mr. Thank Barbieri, you. whenever the board is ready, Mr. Oswald can speak to ESC. We were not ready to speak to seniors right now, but we, Mr. Oswald can speak to ESC right now, whenever you're ready. Okay, let, let me get the other board members who wanted to speak first, if I, if I can. Mrs. Whitfield, then Dr. Robinson, then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. I have um, two things. One, um, it's actually something I said last week, somewhere around midnight. So I'll say it again because we may not have, um, you know, thought about it again. So um, one of the things that I said to Dr. Fenoy, um, and I still think holds water, is that um, if we can, um, maybe we can be really fluid in those two week spaces between groups coming back because um, I think it really is more dependent on how many teachers come back. And whether or not we, if we don't have a lot of students coming, then the capacity is really what decides how many kids can come back. If we have, um, you know, the capacity for 50% uh, of the kids to come back in phase two, and we only have 20 show up, then we would open it to the next groups is what I'm hoping. Um, that's kind of the vision that I have is that it doesn't necessarily mean that all these groups have to wait till their turn. It's really whatever the, the ability for the number of teachers versus the number of, of student participants we have. So that's the thought process I have. The second thing, um, we had a, an email really in just like the last hour from a parent um, who brought up something really interesting that maybe um, Mr. Oswald can address in his discussion, but it was about, um, you know, one of the concerns with our um, bringing back the clusters um, first or bringing back um, uh, ESE groups. Um, some of them are supposed to be mainstreamed and if we only brought them back, that would be a violation of their of their agreement of the of the state statute, and that and that concerns me. Um, that being said, the other thing that really concerns me is not providing services to these ESE students um, because I do think they are one of our um, some of those students are some of our most at risk children, and I would love to see them come back. Um, I would really like. I know uh, we're not voting on this tonight, but I would like to add them to our phase two group. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of wanted that from the beginning. So I'll, I'll stop with my comments and questions and I'll wait for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Whitfield. Dr. Robinson, then Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Um, before I address this, I need to go back to what I thought I heard Mr. Barbieri say. And I heard you say four weeks that this is what I thought I heard. 
that after we enter into stage two, that the seniors would not be able to come back for four weeks. Now, I don't know if I misheard, but what I want to be clear about is we do not know what the interval will be between um, groups of children, do we? Dr. Robinson, the plan that we adopted last week included that phasing in the it was every, four weeks? Two weeks, every two weeks a group comes back. And so four weeks after we first open our classrooms, unless there's a change in the pandemic that causes us to, to delay, that, that every two weeks the group will come back. So by the fourth week, all the students that want to come back will be given the opportunity to come back. That's, that's what we have on the plan that was presented to us. Okay, so, but that's not all the students. Okay, let me just leave that alone. Okay, I, I, okay, I think I'm getting into, into weeds now that are not appropriate. Um, but the point that Mrs. Whitfield made is an appropriate point that I, I still haven't seen it yet that we know how with each school, how many students it can hold, space six feet apart, in regular classroom space, and then how many it can hold when you add the media center, yada, 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 right? So, okay, so that's that's that. Um, okay, I'm a, let me just leave it alone. I'm gonna leave it alone, thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and I'm in agreement that we must bring the ESC students in and certainly are working with the superintendent as well as uh, Kevin McCormick on which groups, because you know that we have some real uh, uh, profound students that truly need to be in. Uh, one of the things I've learned that we may be getting lawsuits as it relates to those children this past year and not getting the services that they need. I don't know if that's something we're dealing with here in Palm Beach County, but I know it's being dealt with uh, across the country. So I am certainly in favor of getting that piece done. But as I look at the plan itself, uh, and when uh, Mr. Oswell, when you and the principal sent out these intent forms, and I noticed that we were actually deciding which groups would come first and so on and meet, uh, with the mitigation based on where we are. I don't know if parents actually know when they fill it out to say that they want to stay with distance learning, uh, they want to re uh, return to the brick and mortar, that they may not be getting there in phase two. They may not be getting there until later. And I don't know if anyone's explaining those things to parents, because when I read this, it sounds like the principals are dialoguing with the parents. They're looking at their space to decide who can come back when and how. And it's almost like Mrs. Whitfield says, and Dr. Robinson, you don't know what your needs are because you haven't really done the measurements and you don't know how many people have actually asked for it. We're just putting the surveys out. So I'm just hoping that we're being real clear with parents when they say they want to return to uh, their physical campus, that that may not happen in phase two. That may not happen until later. And that we're really being honest and clear with them because we really don't know what we're doing at this point in time until we get all the information. How many people are gone? They're no longer within the school anymore. How many uh, uh, want to stay with distance learning? How many truly want to come back? to the school and how much space do you have when you start uh, retrofitting the school and i think when i read this it looks like that when it goes out to parents they think that if they uh select the uh, option two to return to their home school's physical campus that may not happen in uh in phase two so we need to be really clear with people and help them to understand actually how this works apparently it's not going to be a one or two choice they may still be in one, even if they want to. So somebody needs to help me with that because I think that's a bit confusing. Mrs. Andrews, before we go on with the other speakers, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely not in favor of telling parents tonight that, you know, that we're deviating from the plan. The plan was that every two weeks kids would come back. The district is going to have to find a way to make that happen. The only thing that could keep us from doing it is if we don't have enough teachers, but otherwise we need to find the space, whether we put them in cafeterias, we put them in the gymnasiums, we put them in the light, wherever we put them. If we tell the parents tonight that, okay, we're going to back up on what we said last week. So your kids are not going to come back at the second week because we don't have enough room for them. They're not going to be happy. And we're going to get inundated with emails, thousands of emails after tonight. If we're taking the position that we're backing off on what we said last week, last week was every two weeks, a group of students come back 
And it's up to the administration to figure out how to do that because that's the plan that was presented to us. That's the plan we adopted. And I sure as hell am not gonna sit here tonight and tell the parents that we're changing our mind on that. And wait a minute, Mr. Bobby, just let me say something quickly. And I'm not saying that, but I think we, be, we need to be really clear with the parents when they select uh, that option, they need to know that that may not happen for them because it kind of reads that it's going to happen to them. Even though we said that at the board meeting, they need to know it may take a while. So you need to be clear with your communications is what I'm talking about. Vice Chairman Shaw, then Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, I, th I think Mr. Barbieri, you said most of what I was going to say on this. You know, I thought this discussion item was to give idea on who comes back. And it seems like what we've talked about are special education students and, and Mrs. Brill clarified a lot of, of, of the issues there and seniors. And you know, Dr. Fenoy told us at the beginning of this conversation that he's got teams working on all of this kind of stuff. And I really think this is the time for us to stay out of this and let staff do their job. I want to hear from the principals because the principals are the ones who have to administer this stuff, not us. And I think that we're interfering in administrative things that are really none of our business and not our role at this point. Thank you. Mr. Shaw, with all due respect, it's a, it's a, it's a federal law. And we're violating federal law every day that those children don't come back. So it's not a question of it's not our business. It is our business because we are to make sure that we consistently follow all the laws of this country and that there's no waivers for any of the ESC stuff in the federal government. So we have no choice but to make sure that the superintendent and his staff are complying with federal law, which requires students with IEPs to be, that their IEPs are followed. And if, if there's some way that those parents want to waive that requirement, fine. But if they don't, those children have a right to come back to our classrooms as soon as they're open. And that's federal law that we have no authority to waive at this point. All right, Mr. Barbieri, just to be clear, that's not at all what I said. What I said is that we know that the priorities are there and we know that the superintendent and the staff are addressing these issues. And our issue today was, and on that discussion item, was which students come back first. And I think we made that clear. But I really think that we're getting in a position, we're confusing people even more now than they were before by going into all of these other things. Let's let staff do their jobs. And then we know that we have to be in compliance with the ESA. Everybody on the board has been clear on that. So that's not the issue. It's simply letting the superintendent and staff and principals do their jobs and bring us the recommendations and the work they've been doing. Again, with all due respect, I've been having these discussions. I believe Mr. Oswald tonight is prepared to tell us I just want the superintendent and his staff to commit that we're gonna follow the law. And it's not a question of they're not working on it. I know they're working on it. So when we get to Mr. Oswald, hopefully he'll be able to tell us what they planned on doing. But I wanna make sure whatever plan there is, it follows the federal law so that we're not gonna get sued by hundreds of people when we're not providing the services that their children are entitled to under federal law. Dr. Robinson, you are next. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going to support the concept of the ESC students getting priority and to the point that I think Mrs. Brill was making is like all students with IEPs are not the same. And so I, I would leave that um, to Mr. Oswald, Dr. Sheffield, Mr. McCormick and all to, to tease that out. I mean, I, I do think those who are in self-contained units would probably qualify for coming in first. Um, as you will recall, last week I said that I thought we need to look at, have some equity focus here, which would include ESC, ELLs, and underperforming students, right? I don't need to debate that now. I think staff has heard that. I, I hope that that will be taken into consideration. But let me just tell you what I, I need to talk about, um, which is a wee bit off topic, but this two-week thing. So somebody needs to tell me where in the presentation from the plan it said every two weeks, because I would have voted against that. I am very clear that two weeks is not enough time to monitor the impact of bringing people together and to see the metrics that will determine if we need to stand still on that. Now, I'm just telling you, somebody better pull that and tell me, because if I voted mistakenly, if it was in here and said two weeks, and I missed it, then shame on me. But I'm here to tell you right now, and you ask any public health official, 
Two weeks is not enough time. And that is one of the things the Health Advisory Committee needs to weigh in on, how long we stay put after bringing additional children into the facility. We need to monitor that before we then bring more. If you look at the studies out of Israel, and I think it was South Korea, they, op- they, they moved too fast and had to go all the way back to complete shutdown, as I understand. So I know if I had seen two weeks, it like, listen, I would have, just tell me where it is in this plan that it says two weeks, because I'm looking at it now. On page 43, it has the stages. So somebody tell me where it says two weeks. Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, I don't know where it is in the plan, but it, it, so when we talked about the two week window was a minimum, and that was, those were our exact words, and that we would use metrics to determine, and we could either hold or we could bring back kids earlier. If it, so the whole two week window was a baseline. And so that's what the plan implemented. So it was not every two weeks kids are going in, we would use two week window to assess and then make a determination. That's what was said in the plan, Ms. Dr. Robinson. Okay, that's okay. And that is, that's, good and that's reasonable and because you know I'm pushing in on these metrics that we use for monitoring and I won't bother to tell you guys the epidemiology that will say why two weeks is not enough time right but I'm, I'm just glad to hear the clarification from Dr. Fenoy so we need to make sure parents know that we are not saying that every two weeks another group of kids comes into the building we're not saying that we're saying we're starting right now with the plan as outlined, and we're talking about adding ESC children, right? And then we have kind of a stay put time where we're monitoring the metrics. We need our health advisory committee to tell us how long we watch the metrics before we bring additional children into the building. Ms. Wood, I'll get to you in a minute, but Dr. Fenoy, that's not the way that I understood this presented to us last week. It was every two weeks, unless there was a pandemic spike And and there was a reason not to do it. But we told the parents, I've told four different television stations, three newspapers and a radio station this morning that the plan is every two weeks. And then now if we're going to start, you know, figuring out that, well, maybe we're not going to do it two weeks. I understand if there's a spike in the health department tells us that that, like she did already, that it's not a good time to bring it back. And we go from phase two back to phase one. I get that. As long as we're in phase two, we're moving forward. That's my understanding. And if that's not the understanding that, that you all meant to give us last week, then I re- then I want to rescind my vote from last week because that's the plan that I understood. That we were when we move into phase two, unless mm-hmm. there was a change to move this back from phase two, stage two to stage one, that mm-hmm. the, every two weeks the parents would be the, the kids would be brought back so that the longest that any children would not be able to come back is four weeks, unless we re- we we went from stage phase two back to phase one. That's my understanding of the plan that we was presented to us. Right, and if, and if everybody remembers, maybe that's what Dr. Robinson is saying. That you know, if 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 there's a change in the in the status of this county, that so we're no longer in stage two, according to the governor's recommendation, we go back to stage one. That we stop the the two week intervals from coming in, but otherwise we move forward. That was my understanding last week. Mr. Mr. Oswald, if we can let Mr. Hazel speak, we might be able to clear up some of this. But again, let me just say this before he starts. We were very clear. Maybe it was late that. All of this is subject to change based on the data. So the, again, the two week window was a baseline for us to observe once we started bringing kids back. And so again, I, I think I said it, it may have been late where I said, you're the board and I'm the superintendent. We can adjust these things based on the data, but the baseline was two week windows for us to observe and this is who we would bring back. I even said that we could bring back kids earlier if the metrics met that need. So again, those things still have to be determined. There's a lot going on. But again, the two week window was just an observation period. And then what was most important, I guess, from us as a leadership team is who was going in at what time. But again, we may have to stop after the first group goes in. We just don't, we don't, we don't know any of those external factors right now, but that, that's exactly how we presented it. But whenever Mr. Oswald, whenever you're ready for Mr. Oswald to speak, I'll let him go. So it was, so what we presented, I'm just gonna pull up that slide. It was on slide 44. So that after, once we enter into stage two, based on going into phase two and we meet the metrics as a district, we would bring in that first group of students, pre-K, K-1, uh, six and grade nine. And then 
during that two week uh, span, we were going to get used to the new routines on a school campus. And additionally, we're gonna watch those metrics. And if there were no changes in those metrics, two weeks later, we would then bring in the next group, again, adding in grades two, three, seven, and 10. Again, watching those metrics, getting used to those routines, we would bring in, in stage four, the last group of students. Uh, so that is how we present it as Dr. Fenoy. Again, it's uh, every two weeks while at the same time monitoring those metrics that there is no shift. Thank you, Mr. Roswell. Mrs. Whitfield and Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I think honestly, the, the biggest problem here is, is the metric that we wrote on that plan for two weeks does not address capacity. I know I'm saying this again, but I really think that here's the problem. If after two weeks, we don't have enough teachers coming back to address the needs of additional students, we can't open more, more school. We won't have the ability to have more kids come back if we don't have the number of teachers. Conversely, if a ton of teachers come back and we have, a, and we have very few students coming in and we have a lot of capacity within our media centers and our cafeterias and all that, we should be able to move quicker by asking more groups to come back because we have the capacity. So I think really what we need to have is what Dr. Robinson said, how many kids fit in the classrooms at the spacing that we need for the first stage, for the second stage, for the third stage, how many teachers we need for that. And then when we reach those numbers, which are true metrics and not some arbitrary this group, that group, we can prioritize the groups. But I think after prioritizing the groups, then we say, how many kids are in those groups? How many seniors do we have? How many kids do we have in K-1-2? What does it mean to have that many kids come into a campus? And I think that we're not arguing different sides of this. It's just that we need to be able to understand what our true ability is based on teachers, students, and spacing. That's really what we need to know. Ms. Barber, if I can quickly add in. So the questionnaire is going out to both parents and staff on Monday. That is gonna give us a lot of that information so that we understand exactly what the intention is of our families that wanna come back to brick and mortar so we can redesign these school campuses to meet CDC guidelines. That's why this additional time on the calendar will also assist us, our principals, to make those adjustments. So if we have to pivot based on more kids coming back and we cannot fit, we'll have time to do that and make those adjustments. Because they are tied to specific students and families, we'll have more concrete information. Also the, the uh, questionnaire for the staff, for teachers, what are teachers' intentions about coming back on school campus when we go back to bricks and mortar? We need that concrete data to make better decisions about how we reconfigure our school campuses. So this is somewhat fluid that we have to have that data to give you all better information about how we redesign these school campuses. So, and then in a moment, when we talk about ESC students, we can talk about some of the changes that Dr. Sheffield's been working with Mr. McCormick on around uh, that stage two. And just for the board to know, so the operations team, Ms. Whitfield, has measured all of our campuses. Uh, we, have, we have map overlays. Um, I've walked several of the buildings as we get ready for hurricane shelters and this. So all of that is happening. Now the principals, now that they're back in the buildings, and remember as their teams come back, they will, they will be creating these demonstration model classrooms of a distance of a distance learning so that when new teachers come in, they'll have, it's almost like a, a new subdivision. They'll be creating the model and then as new teachers come in, they'll just replicate that. So all of that is in the regionals are already all over that. Uh, Chief Operating Officers team has already been in all the schools and done that. And we have all that data. So we're just, we just have it and now we're working with the schools uh, with the different uh, architectural designs and different pieces, bus loops, so the principals and regionals are actually doing this as we speak. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. Dr. Robinson, and then Ms. Brill. Oh. Wait a minute. There, there we go. Okay, thank you. So, all right. So I see this two weeks in here, so I'm gonna have to own that. I should have raised hell about this last week. Two weeks is not enough time. The incubation period is two days to two weeks. So then what you have to do is you're going to wait for somebody to, unless we're going to have frequent testing and the turnaround for the testing now is, you know, way too long, 10 to 14 days I'm hearing. So what's going to happen is if you're using this two weeks, 
measure, then you're going to be bringing in more kids and then weeks later find out that you have, you have a spike, right? And then you will have exposed all these other kids. I'm just saying, you don't have to believe me. Ask, ask some public health people, but I'm just telling you, the, I, I guess this two-week thing is some really idealistic um, thinking, right? I mean, extremely idealistic. And we need to walk that back. I, I, you know, I understand and appreciate, Mr. Barbieri, that you've been out there telling people um, what is written here that I did not see. But I'm telling you, it is bad, bad public health. And we are in a pandemic. We are having all this conversation because we're trying to save lives of children, staff, parents and community. Right. And two weeks is not enough. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Ms. Brill and then Ms. McQuinn. Thank you. So I'm going to bring us back to ESC for a moment, but I just will say that when I heard the plan presented last week, I agree with what Dr. Vinoy said. It, they used a two-week period, but it, it really what I got took away was we have to be nimble and that it may be longer. And it may, you know, I, I didn't ever envision it as being shorter, but I do think that, you know, we're going to have to go with it the way, I mean, we don't know how to predict what's going to happen when we open up. So we are definitely going to have to be um, nimble about what we're doing. For ESC, just to backtrack, and I'm sorry because it, a lot of this is overwhelming, thinking more clearly, I think when we say we want to bring ESC back in that first group, it should be bring back ESC students based upon their IEP needs. And because I am one of the people that fought for inclusion. And for me, it would have been more damaging for, you know, to have a child put in basically um, an, a, an exclusive situation. So based on their needs, you will know, you know, who is not being able to be educated on, on the distance learning. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Ms. Um, Ms. Bro, Ms. McQuinn, you're next. Yeah. Um, so in the presentation last week, I decided to make my decision about my vote to accept Dr. Fenoy's recommended plan that it was all virtual to open, except we were discussing the date. I, I, I put my trust in his recommendation and I still have trust in his recommendation that he's working with the health advisory committee. So I understood what we were voting on when Mr. Oswald just put that other piece back up on the screen. So I, I really, I just, two things. One is that I, um, I still support that plan because I believe it was very clear to us that that plan is fluid and that he is very comfortable bringing us back for whatever kind of emergency meeting he needs to bring us back for if the data changes. Get that out of the way for my part. The other is in terms of Mr. Shaw's um, and, and our discussion about the, um, the next pieces of the physical reopening plan, I, no, I don't, don't want to tell the superintendent and staff how to do it. I do think not tonight, but we can either send those as board questions or not agenda items, but all of the things that we know have come to us as questions that we just give the superintendent an alert so that when they provide the details, we don't come at them and say, well, you didn't give us this and you didn't give us this. So I just wanted to clarify that piece also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. So Mr. Superintendent, since we're past the, the time certain for non-agenda speakers and we have another board discussion item to go to, can you just bring back to us next week what the plan is with respect to the ESC students? And I, I think I indicated earlier, it's the ones with the IEPs that need to be satisfied by having them in the classroom. So certainly if it means that they have to be inclus inclusive, that those kids, would we wouldn't be able to satisfy that. So we wouldn't bring them back anyway. But can you just bring back to us next week exactly who you would you know, who you would include in the first batch to come back, assuming we have teachers, sure. we have room and, and make sure that the general council has an opportunity to weigh in on that so that we certainly are following the law with respect to at least her opinion on whether we're- No, I, I agree that, yeah, we, yes, I can commit to that. All right, if we can hold any more discussion or we can come back to this if you all want to, but we have we have uh, four, 
five non-agenda speakers and we certainly have to get to at this point. So Mr. Ramasar, uh, would you go ahead and, uh, and play the five recordings for those five speakers, please? Non-agenda speakers, Carl. Good evening, um, board members and superintendent. Uh, once again, the epidemic and the pandemic still continues, but as we look at what is taking place right now with the, uh, the need to start school, but the need not to have school start, um, we're looking at what we can do in the community to assist uh, further with the needs of uh, the community as we try to build capacity. Now, um, we've been, we focused on last time, the two words, epidemic and pandemic. I wanted to, this time, um, include two other words that I think are very important for our understanding, and that is stupidity and ignorance. Well, they say stupidity behavior that shows a lack of good sense or judgment, but they say ignorance is a state of being uninformed and unaware. It can also mean that a person is lazy to notice something or is doing something so deliberately. As for stupidity, it is knowing what is right and trying to find it in the wrong. Stupidity is not the lack of knowledge, but the illusion of having it. You know, we in Palm Beach County, we did all kinds of disparity studies. We did um, all kinds of training and everything else, supposedly to address the worst part of your system, which is your non-immigrant black population inside of Palm Beach County School District. And we still linger and continue to have the major problems that we have because we haven't had the partnership that is necessary in order to change such a phenomenon. I'm praying sincerely still for you guys that you would inform our community member of those who have really have some kind of content understanding of what is actually going on with what is needed for our children. Most of the time we have people that are still trying to do the same old thing, the same things that they were doing in the past that didn't work before. And we know that they're not going to work now. And I'm also focusing a lot of my energy on Florida Statute 1003.428, which is supposed to um, revolutionize the entire educational system here in the state of Florida, but it doesn't appear that uh, we have yet um, to put this before us in a real meaningful way. Um, the community is moving forward, and we need those of you who are board members to uh, really raise your voice and really add to the, the sound that is needed for our community to understand because we, are, we do have a unique opportunity at this time because of our children being home with their parents. And if we could get our parents to understand the need for them to um, um, comply with the Florida statute, um, it possibly would help you by the time school truly starts, or if it should start, it would give you some kind of real help in order to move our children out of the um, bottom position. Thank you for your time, and I pray for your uh, safety and your success. And, um, and lastly, um, we have a problem with people asking us for votes, but they don't have any ability to answer us with any kind of means for help. We are in the voting cycle. Those are, um, that are requiring votes, we need some more help um, on your end so that we can give some help on our end. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kara Holt and I will be speaking on a non-agenda topic. My children attend Addison Meisner Elementary School and on behalf of Addison Meisner families, I want to talk to you about an investment in the health and safety of Addison Meisner students, teachers and staff as the school is in the process of being rebuilt. As a result of COVID-19 to reduce the presence of viruses, Experts have made recommendations to improve indoor air quality in schools. We respectfully request the School District of Palm Beach County to one, increase ventilation through AC units capable of maximizing the exchange of inside air with outside air. Two, use HEPA filters. Three, install sensors to maintain optimal humidity levels and four, implement ultraviolet air cleaning technologies. To improve indoor air quality, inside air can be exchanged with clean outdoor air and can then be filtered by HEPA filters. The more potentially contaminated indoor air that can be exchanged with outdoor air, the more viral particles can be diluted. 
For recirculated air, HEPA filters are designed to trap 99.97% of tiny particles, including the coronavirus. The new Addison Meisner is currently slated to only use MERV-8 filters, which is a very low filtration level, ineffective against viruses. Humidity levels in buildings can also be used to improve indoor air quality. Often, our buildings are way outside the optimal range, so experts recommend buildings install sensors to monitor temperature and humidity to maintain the optimal air quality. Last, air cleaning technologies such as UV lighting methods can be integrated into mechanical systems. From speaking with the architect for the new school, I understand no redesign would be required to implement these air cleaning measures, as they can easily be added to the ductwork. However, if in-depth solutions are not possible, portable in-room air cleaners are a secondary option. We need to make the interiors of the buildings as safe as possible. Systems that improve indoor air quality are not prohibitively expensive. It just takes the care and thoughtfulness to add them to the building design. Now is the time to make these safety enhancements while our school is being rebuilt. Additionally, touch-free fixtures in restrooms and other areas can help reduce the spread of germs and viruses and are also environmentally and budget friendly. The COVID-19 pandemic may be a stressor that pushes many buildings to adopt healthy practices and those benefits will linger long after the outbreak fades. Fewer employee sick days, fewer sick children who miss school are benefits we will all appreciate every flu season and year round. Please redistribute or allocate money to the rebuild of Addison Meisner so the indoor air quality can be improved and the new Addison Meisner can be a healthy, safe school. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adrian Climo and I am looking to speak at the July 22nd um, meeting. I wanted to speak on the topic of reopening schools. Uh, I am a registered nurse who has been a school nurse in the Palm Beach County Schools for the past eight years. Um, a mother to two young children, one of which will be attending a Palm Beach County Middle School this year and a wife to a Palm Beach County school teacher. So I say that the reopening of school decision plays a big part in my family's life. The concern I have is this. Now that every Palm Beach County School Health nurse has been either giving voluntary separation packages, forced into early retirement, or placed on indefinite furlough with no pay, how does the school district plan to work in school nurses to their reopening plan? I'm assuming that this would be more necessary given the health pandemic our country and even more specifically our county is going through. I just wanna let the school district know that because of the decision of the healthcare district to furlough us, there will be a shortage of school nurses when the time comes for the children to attend in person. I know that I can speak for myself and others when I say that I do not have any PTO or sick time to carry me through this waiting period as I have been on furlough since March and I personally do not get paid over the summer. I love my job as do the rest of my colleagues and we would love to go back to it, but this four month furlough has been a financial strain on us all. I understand that these are unprecedented times and the safety of everyone is our first priority, but realistically, most of us will have to find a new job to help pay the bills while we wait to find out if and when schools will open up brick and mortar. Prior to coronavirus, the clinic is usually busy. I know I personally have seen up to 60 children a day in my clinic, and we routinely see diabetics and children who take daily medication. We attend every emergency as well as work in hand in hand with the guidance counselors to address mental health issues and provide the students with a caring and safe environment when they are going through issues. I just can't imagine how much busier the clinics will be when we do go back. Is the school district aware of what is happening to the school nurses and how do they plan to care for the Palm Beach County school children's health as well as the teachers health and safety with the foreseeable shortage of school nurses? Thank you for listening. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Rosa Harrell, and I've um, I've reached out to several of the managers, uh, upper managers, about um, the problems that that we're having in transportation. And because of the reason that I spoke up, I've been harassed. I've been it's like torture. 
Sometimes you don't even want to come to work because of the things that you experience. They have you, they say, you follow protocol. You follow protocol. You go to, um, I went to uh, Crystal Washington. I went to Jeff McGee. I went to Wanda Paul. Nothing, nothing happens. And the reason nothing happened because people feel like no one cares. No one speaks up because they feel like if they speak up, then they're going to have to endure what I had to endure because of the reason I, because I spoke up. I've been trying to, um, how you say, um, come in and sit down and talk with Dr. Um, Bernard about the situation in transportation. I've been told by several people, okay, um, you can talk, but it's nothing that's going to be done. That's the reason why people are afraid to come forth because they're afraid that nothing is going to be done. And then they have to go through what I had to go through with the bullying, the harassment by your upper management. I don't understand why is it that no one takes actions when it comes to your upper management. But if it was the driver, or a monitor, it's like everybody is so quick to to jump to to um, termination or some type of discipline with with them. But when it comes to upper management, it's like they take these people and they they just let let them continue to do the things that they do. I went to Wonder Paul. And when I went to Wonder Paul, it seems like things got even worse. You know why? Because the people that I came to her complaining about, she gave them the okay, okay, do whatever you want to do. I've been investigated for no reason of mine. And then uh, again, a second second investigation was launched against me by Crystal Washington for buying uh, the students a gift for Christmas. And, you, and that's not harassment? Something has to be done. These people are put in the office. They, it's, it's a lot of things that you all don't know because they don't want you all to know. And the people that are supposed to come and try to tell you guys about things that's happening in transportation, they're not telling y'all what's really going on in transportation. Thank you for listening and be safe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelsey Gowan, um, and I just wanted to share my opinion um, with the school board. Um, <clears throat> when teachers are striking, the kids suffer, and teachers are not striking yet. But the Florida Education Association is suing government, Governor Ron DeSantis for requiring a return back to the classroom. And this is not a productive use of time or energy. And quite frankly, it is petty. Um, every life matters, but we need to focus on the quality of life. And education is a huge indicator of the kids' quality of life. And I think it's important for the kids to go back to school. And um, these are a couple of statistics um, from the CDC website um, that are relevant. Um, there are 1.47 million people in Palm Beach County, and we have had 685 deaths in Palm Beach County. Um, that equals out to 0.046% of people who even got COVID have died from COVID. 
Um, and that's from the CDC website. So I think that we should really think about that. Um, thank you. Have a good day. All right, uh, board members, that's the end of our non-agenda speakers. Uh, the next item, Mrs. Whitfield, go ahead. Do you have something? Um, I just, I was wondering if we could still hear if Mr. Oswald had a presentation he was trying to give to us. Um, I felt like that kind of got a little bit cut short. I don't want to um, make any more comments on my own, but I felt like if he, if he had something he wanted to share, I just wanted to make sure we gave him that chance. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Oswald, did you have more? Because you were kind of cut off. Yeah, if we could go back to that discussion item, we would like to wrap up around ESE students. We are scheduled to meet with each of the board members to review the state template with each of you tomorrow as well as Monday. We want to submit that. Dr. Sheffield has been working with Mr. McCormick addressing the concerns for our ESE students. As Ms. Brill said, some of our students are able to, needs are able to be met um, better in a distance learning than others. And so we are making some adjustments to that. Dr. Sheffield, would you like to share some of what we're going to add in regarding our ESC students? Um, yes, well, good evening. And uh, Mr. McCormick is also on as well. So if we have additional questions, but in looking at the um, feedback, and of course, I'm talking with many of the board members I had an opportunity to speak with regarding this issue. Um, in meeting with Mr. McCormick and the team, what we've decided is that along also in stage two, as we were talking about, um, our ESC centers that will come back into stage two. We also will be adding to that our self-contained um, students, which are our most students that requires the most intensive services. And also in stage two, in adding that group of students, um, we will also will be opening up our schools for our for those students to receive their therapeutic treatments, some physical therapy or what have you. And we will be able to do that via appointments and so forth. So if Mr. McCormick, if he wants to come in and he can continue with um, that discussion, want to make sure I didn't leave anything off. Uh, Dr. Sheffield, you did cover it. Um, you know, the concern about bringing all back is the least restrictive environment issue um, where um, students would, as Ms. Brill said, uh, not be receiving the services that are on the current IEP because their general education peers wouldn't be back with them. So that's how we came to the conclusion of, in phase two, ensuring our students in self-contained programs uh, to come back to make sure that uh, they get the services required that are on their IEP. And Dr. Sheffield, you worked with uh, legal counsel today as well, correct? Yes, we did. We worked with the legal. Um, Laura Pincus may be on. Thank you, Julianne. Julianne and her team has just been wonderful. Um, after we went through the plan with executive cabinet, um, the state plan, the draft. And again, we're looking forward to sharing and reviewing that plan with board members tomorrow and on Monday. That was a big discussion and we met afterwards to talk, to continue to talk about making certain that if we could take a deeper dive and look at the stages that we were bringing back all of our students, but most importantly, our ESC students. And this is where we are in terms of adding the self-contained group. And again, opening up the schools to where we can also open up for many of those therapeutic um, services, treatments, and so forth via appointments only. And of course, practicing social distancing. As it relates to our seniors in that conversation, um, at this time, we wanna keep that somewhat fluid till we get the data back from these questionnaires from our our, our uh, families and their intention of coming back on campus as well as staff. So again, um, if we're able to accommodate, we will definitely add the seniors into stage two, but we wanna keep that somewhat fluid until we have um, more data on the questionnaire uh, from what our intentions of our families. Our high school campuses are huge. They uh, have many students and to be able to accommodate the previous conversations around CDC guidelines, six feet, distancing, we want to make sure we can have some time to be able to, you know, phase that in. So Mr. Oswald, will, will your, your survey is going to include, so we'll be able to identify when the parents say, yeah, they want to send their kids back, which ones are seniors or not. So we have an idea how many seniors there are that want to come back. Yes, they are tied to the specific students. So for all the community that will be listening, this will roll out on Monday, this questionnaire and parents' intention. When we do go into stage two, their intention if they want to come back 
to um, bricks or mortar or if they want to stay in a distance learning, we'll have better information as well as um, from our, our teaching staff as well. All right, thank you. I saw three hands, Ms. Brill, then Ms. McQuinn, and then Vice Chairman Shaw, uh, Ms. Brill first. Thank you, and thank you for the clarification on ESC. I think that will help a lot of people that are watching the meeting. I know that I've gotten some messages that people are really confused, you know, when they hear us speaking and aren't really sure. So to that end, um, to the superintendent, you know, the devil is in the details, and I'm not asking for you to present the actual template, but would you be ready next week, um, I guess as your COVID update or opening update to share the details um, that are submitted so that the public will know, for example, if seniors will be, you know, because it's gonna have to be in our template, I'm assuming, um, you know, with what you're submitting, unless I'm assuming wrong, but I would like the public, we're gonna be updated ourselves this week and, and on Monday but I would like to make sure that the public is updated. Would that be something possible? Uh, I'm not sure at this time. I definitely want to get you guys through it first. Um, I actually need to call the DOE about that. So let me let me, let me me get back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown, Dr. Dr. Fenoy. Uh, Ms. McQuinn and then Vice Chairman Shaw. This is just quick and I'm clarifying um, for a parent who sent an email. Um, so students, any student, if they don't want to return to bricks and mortar, we're giving them that option, correct? Yes, ma'am, we are giving them that option. Thank you, I was sure, just wanted to make sure I was right. Thank you. Vice Chairman Shaw. Thank you. Mr. Oswald, When as part of the plan, if you give us an update, on um, and I, I don't think it's necessarily part of the plan, but how will we how will we be managing the compliance with um, with uh, Stoneman Douglas and all of the drills and stuff at the same time once we do start getting back in school, so that we have some idea. And again, I understanding that that would be fluid. And the other comment I forgot to say this at the beginning um, at the League of Cities meeting today. Uh, the president of the League of Cities talked about the uh, digital divide and the and the request that the district has made with uh, the cities and the county uh, to work on on the Wi-Fi issue. Next Thursday, there's uh, an issues forum, and that's the uh, topic for the uh, issues forum. Is that coordinated thing? Thank you. Hey, Mr. Mr. Shaw, and to the board um, on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Nothing has changed. They haven't waived anything. We are still required to do everything. And so Chief Kitzrow and his team have had to have that worked out. Um, Barbara Tremembers, before she left, made sure a lot of our early compliance stuff was done. And so we, the team is still functioning in that capacity. And truthfully, we are still in the middle of a grand jury. So I'll just leave that right there. Thank you, Dr. Fenoy. Um, Mrs. Andrews, um, we may have may or may not have covered everything on your board discussion item, but you're up next, BRD four. Thank you. Um, I would like to say that you know we were working last week until about twelve fifteen, and Miss Paul uh, came on pretty late <laughs> to talk with us about the operational piece of her plan. I've actually spoken with her personally. I think we need a little bit more detail not just for this board, but for, for the people, for the uh, for the parents and for the community. A lot of people are afraid to come back to the building. They want to know exactly how we are going to clean uh, when we start thinking about the maintenance piece, the custodial piece, the buses, the cafeteria. When you look at all the food service, the environmental, I heard somebody in here say today about some kind of um, something that had to be in the filter. <laughs> They're not cleaning the filters with the right kind of uh, 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 equipment with the right kind of uh, disinfectant or whatever. So we need a lot more detail into this. I think what would be nice for us to have is a presentation. Uh, it's going to be fluid. It's going to be changing. I'd like to know, since we may be coming back to the board uh, room soon, uh, Mr. Barbier, you've seen it. Uh, you know what it looks like. I guess we have the petitions, how it's going to work with with uh, making sure uh, uh, we have everything that we need so that we won't get sick as we move forward. But the same thing for the schools. I think we need more information 
And it needs to be uh, constant communications with the students and their parents and the community. We want them to all come back. We don't want them to leave Palm Beach County. And the more we can show about how we're making sure that we keep them safe from the operational standpoint, it would be great. So I would like to see us have some type of presentation uh, from the uh, operational side with a few slides or whatever so that we can kind of keep up with this. And then as it changes because of whatever is going on, and what we're doing if somebody gets sick and how we actually uh, work a school if someone uh, gets the coronavirus, COVID-19 and how it would, what kind of things, the precautions we would do. A lot more detail to parents so that when they send their children back, they will know that we have most things uh, in place uh, and it's a continuous conversation. So this is something I'd like to see us do, uh, not just for us, but for the parents and the community. Yeah, we will commit to, uh, the team is absolutely working on all of those details. Um, there's only one small hiccup. So Mr. Tanner will be working with Carol Bass on all of the, re the uh, workshop requests of the board as they continue to pile up. Um, and so we will, we will that, that conversation is actually happening today, I mean tomorrow. So I will, we will put that on a list and we will start working with the board during our one-on-ones around that priority list. Yes, ma'am, we will do that. Ahead, yeah, it's not just for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinoy. I'm glad that you're going to work it with us too. But I think it needs to be out in the sunshine for the parents because I don't want them to leave Palm Beach County afraid about whatever we're doing. They need to know how well we're working to keep sure to make sure that the building and the facilities are going to be safe when the students return. So, you know, I know we have a lot of workshops, but this is one that should take a little bit of priority since, you know, we don't know when we'll be getting in phase two, but we want people to be educated way before then as to what kinds of things to look for as we begin to go back into the building. Okay, yes, ma'am. All right, board members, is there any other discussion or any uh, anything else you want to talk about? Otherwise, we're through with the agenda. This is Andrew. Yeah, I got one more uh, discussion item. And Dr. Robinson, I heard you tonight talking about the health piece. Uh, we do need to get educated. Uh, you know, when I look at uh, uh, the uh, health director, uh, Mrs. Alonzo, giving those presentations to the county, we as a board need to get some presentations about what it is. The health, we're talking about metrics and when we're going to have kids come back. And we're looking at television and you get different kinds of information. You're talking to a lot of people with different <laughs> information. I think as a board, we need to really uh, be able to hear about how it is from somebody that we can rely on. And you have a, a, a health advisory committee, uh, Superintendent Fenoy. I think this board needs to hear from them periodically so that we will be able to tell folks that we are getting educated on some of these issues as it relates to the health of, uh, of our, our school district as well as our community. So the only challenge with that is the health advisory committee are a bunch of working professionals. And, and, and part of our original agreement was that we, now the staff, we can present the findings. All the meetings are recorded. I can have those sitting in the board. You can view all of them. Um, I can also have staff write up a summary of what those meetings occurred for the board. Um, right now, I'm just not comfortable asking those people to come in and present to the board, but I'll be glad for us to present any of that information. There's, it's, it's more of a working group. So they are educating us as staff as to the language of some of this stuff means. And so right now we're focused on, they're helping us with metrics. They're helping us um, you know, with all of the different people, everything that the board has described today, that's what they're helping us with. But I can definitely commit our team to updating the board um, as, as we learn more from the health advisory committee, I just can't commit to, cause there's not a leader. There's not a chairman. It's just, it's just, it's, it's a bunch of working professionals in the medical field who have volunteered to help us, but I can get all that information. I can make, again, Jay Boggess is doing a great job and Dr. Maris, it is, they, those meetings are recorded. I can have that for you. You just let me know and I'll make sure that you get that information. Uh, just another question. If I can follow up Mr. Barbieri. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Uh, with uh, our health uh, director, uh, Mrs. Alonzo, uh, she does present to the county commission, but it's too much to have her come to present to the school board. No, I didn't say I haven't asked her. So, I, you know, I, I don't want to impose upon people until I, I have the conversation with them. I do want to get all the information because we are being bombarded with a lot mm -hmm. of questions about it, you know, and yep. so we can say that we're hearing it, but I'd like to kind of have the uh, 
the data, the information, as well as some presentations. The public needs to know. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, we can also, the, the actual meetings, I can have them placed on the website since they're done in the sunshine. So if the public wants to see any of those meetings, we can have those links. Um, again, the board, I can make sure that, that your, all your assistants have that information. So if you want to watch those meetings, um, <clears throat> you're actually also welcome to, well, I'm sorry. We had, you had to let us know and we'd have to notice it if the board were to come, but you can participate and watch it. Um, and so what we'll do is we will, and what I can do also is have uh, Jay Bogus and his team after every meeting create the sort of summary to present to the board to educate you on what we're dealing with. Um, but I let me let me set some expectations. It is literally a working group. Like it's, they, you know, we we debate. There's some there's some uh, uh, you know you know again and, and at times as I stated at the meeting yesterday because we met yesterday, honestly there are times where it sounds like they're talking a foreign language, which I'm sure people who deal with education professionals find that sometimes. So. They're doing a good job of translating. Information is changing. The beauty of it is you have epidemiologists, again, public health officials, pediatricians, business people. There's a lot of people on there. But it, we're working through it. Our next meeting is actually slated for uh, two weeks at 5 p.m. And so we will definitely try to do that, Ms. Ms. Andrews. Great. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Dr. Uh, Dr. Robert, Ms. McQuinn was first, and then Dr. Robinson. I just want to say that, um, yes, I I spoke earlier about my depending on Dr. Fenoy bringing us the recommendations uh, from the Health Advisory Committee as he sees it appropriate to bring that. So I'm counting on that. I think it's a great idea that people can just watch the recordings. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. McQuinn. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so, and I want to say I, I'm, so I've been part of this health advisory committee. Um, and I think it's fortunate for you because I'm bilingual. I speak medical and I speak education. So what's really happening is, fa is fascinating to me because I have had to tell physicians <laughs> that they need to be really careful with their words. Um, in explaining things to educators, right? Because, okay, I just want to, but it's, it's as if you have, it's, it's, it's as if you have a surgeon trying to write the reading curriculum, okay? I mean, it's, it's that cross language, right? Um, and so um, trying to get everybody to hear each other is is like really a fascinating problem, but, but I think that um, once the group outlines um, the metrics that they think that should be followed and the benchmarks within those metrics, that the I think the the report every meeting that someone suggested would include the status of the, those metrics, right, in in Palm Beach County, and then and including the school utilization. So once we know how many students can be held inside the building, we can say how many students are in there, right? And so then forecasting to see, you know, when additional students can come in. I'm still going to fight about that two weeks thing. And I, I'm going to encourage Dr. Fenoy to take that to the Health Advisory Committee because it's much too long for me to explain now. But I just think that that is a mistake. Um, but anyway, so... Uh, I think that we can probably um, get get the information you want, um, Mrs. Andrews, through those reports. But at the very beginning, as I said earlier, everybody needs to have some education on what we do know about this virus. And, and then I have to caution my medical colleagues to be very cautious about the words they use so that they're not misinterpreted, right? Um, but I, I, I would love to see that happen um, sooner rather than later because I could just imagine, I could just imagine how it's swirling around, you know, because it's, it's just, it's not your world, but you have to make decisions based upon it. So, and, and I actually, what I, I think would we can get there. Board, um, and, I, and I know Jay's listening, so Jay, let's get these reports ready. But, but seriously, I would, I would encourage the board before, before you get the reports to actually listen to the meetings. It'll help give you some context in the conversation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Fenoy. 
Um, if there's nothing else, I just want to take the opportunity. We sh should thank Mrs. Saul and our lobbyists. I mean, she's been providing a lot of information for us, and I know we're being able to use to answer questions from parents. I mean, I, we get almost daily updates on which schools are, which districts are starting at what time, so we know where we're at in the mix, as well as the, what districts have adopted plans and which districts haven't. So uh, appreciate appreciate all the work that she's putting into it. And of course, she keeps us updated on what's happening in Washington, D.C. with the conversations that are going there as our federal lobbyists. Mrs. Andrews. Yes, and I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Solnett because she is really on those Council of Great City School uh, meetings with me and getting that data to us, uh, very influential with the legislative piece. As you all know that the Senate is back in session with the HERO money and the act so that we hopefully will get some money to come to our school district. So uh, Mrs. Solnett has been a leader with the Council of Great City Schools along with Mr. Burke and trying to work through the legislative piece as well as the finance piece so that we can hopefully the Senate pass the HEROES Act, which will help the cities. And there's a, a portion of that money will come to the school districts. Thank you, Mrs. Anders. All right, unless board members, unless you have anything else, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion by Dr. Robinson, seconded by Ms. Brill. I hope there's no discussion on that. All in favor, opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Good night, everyone.